I'm trying to take a picture. Oh, okay. No, I went to go over there. Yeah, ready? Ready? That's you. You do be. You gotta be. All right, we're going to go ahead and start the meeting tonight. I think there's some more chairs coming out for folks. Welcome to the January 24th meeting of the MCCSC Board of School Trustees. We ask that you please come to order. As we begin tonight's meeting, as board president, I would like to acknowledge that the board received a request from the Monroe County branch of the NAACP to delay the final vote on the racial equity policy. I support this request and existing board policy. While I support this request, we have an existing board policy that pro prohibits the removal of the second reading of the policy from the agenda prior to the meeting. Therefore, as we have officially begun the meeting, I would like to make a formal motion that we remove item 5.01 under old business policy 5518 racial equity from tonight's agenda by suspending a vote on this matter until the next regular monthly meeting. If this motion is approved, we will not vote on item 5.01 tonight and it will be placed on February's agenda. If the motion is, um, is not approved, the board will be required to vote to approve or reject the policy later under old business. You have heard my motion to suspend a vote on item 5.01 and to table it until next month's meeting. Do I have a second? So, moved. Go ahead. so it's moved by myself and seconded by April that we suspend item 5.01 policy 5518 racial equity and to table it until next month's meeting. Do I have any comments from the board? All right. Hearing no further comments, all those in favor of the motion to suspend policy 5518 racial equity and to table it until next month's meeting signify by saying aye. 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 Against no, any abstentions? Motion is carried. This is time that we set aside to celebrate members of our community and Dr. Winston is gonna share those with us tonight. Thank you very much, President Schur, Dr. Hoswald, the Board of Trustees and community members. It is my pleasure to share a few highlights of this month's celebration of success and our monthly Equity Spotlight Award winner. Congratulations to Sydney Young, a junior at the Academy of Science and Entrepreneurship. Sydney is currently serving as the Region 11 President for the Indiana Business Professionals of America Association. Business Professionals of America is the leading career technical student organization for students pursuing careers in business management, office administration, information technology, and other related career fields. In December, Sydney presided over the Region 11 BPA competition, and in March, she, along with the other 13 state officers, will conduct the general sessions for the state conference in front of over 1,000 Indiana BPA members. In addition, I'd like to offer congratulations to Dr. Julie Marie Fry. Dr. Fry was recently recognized as a 2023 I Love My Librarian honoree. The I Love My Librarian Award invites library users to recognize the accomplishments of exceptional public school, college, community college, or university librarians. Each honoree receives a $5,000 cash prize, a $750 donation to their library, and complimentary registration to the ALA's conference. Dr. Fry was one of only 10 libra librarians nationwide to be awarded out of over 1,500 total nominees. And finally, our Equity Spotlight Award. The Equity Spotlight Award recipient for January 2023 is Becky Boyle, a social studies teacher at Bachelor Mid Middle School. Mrs. Boyle is dedicated to deepening her students' understanding of the lived experiences of people from all races and backgrounds by providing creative and meaningful learning opportunities for all students. Thank you very much. Thank you. On behalf of the board, thank you, Dr. Winston, and congratulations to all those that have been recognized tonight. We'll now proceed to public comments. Thank you to all who signed and acknowledged the guidelines uh, to speak to the board tonight. As a reminder, Ms. Butcher over there will ring the bell once to signal you have 30 seconds. And after your time is finished, she'll hit the bell five times to signal that your time is concluded. Uh, first, we'll have Mary Wiggins, and then after that, JL Davis. Well, hello. 
and thank you for having me. My name is Mary Williams, and I'm a teacher here at MCCSC, and I'm here to talk about the, um, the racial equity policy. I, um, of course, say that I grew up here in Bloomington. I went to school as an elementary, middle, and high school student. I um, went to Indiana University, and I did leave and come back. Um, and I ended up replacing my first grade teacher. And it wasn't maybe my original idea to be a teacher, but um, kind of like Jonah, I got sucked into this. And my parents are educators, and they instilled an importance of sharing and imparting knowledge. And one thing I will say about um, growing up here in Bloomington, we, we enjoy the diversity of our population, but we also need to acknowledge that there is a need to have students who are of color to be represented and spoken for. And I could not be more ecstatic to have this racial equity policy put into place. And what's more inspiring are the students who brought it up. It wasn't adults. These were students who came and expressed their need and desire to make improvements in our corporation. And I think as an educator and as a community, we need to rally around and support their work that they put in, their sweat, their equity. And I feel that this is moving our community and our corporation in the right direction. It's a wonderful framework to move forward to establish equity and inclusion. We're already doing the work as it is, but it's adding teeth to what we're doing. And I really would like for all of us to consider supporting this. Um, it would help us as a community, as well as our institution to making sure that all children of color and, and everyone feeling safe and included. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, JL, and then after that, Molly Barwick. Hi, I am JL Davis. I am a sophomore at Bloomington High School South, and I was um, one of the original students to come up here and speak about um, the anti-racism policy. Um, and so I'll just be um, talking about the changes that still need to be made. Taking a whole school approach to anti-racism means putting the views and ideas of students at the center of everything you do. Throughout this experience, three other students in high have been fighting for the anti-racist policy to go through for many months. After the tedious loopholes it took to get here, our goals have still not been met. And therefore, I urge the school board to vote to table this policy. I know you may be wondering why we want to table this policy after all the hard work that we've done, but the policy that is before our eyes today doesn't reflect the work that we have so vigorously worked for. For starters, we would like to table this policy because there's a lack of student voices being heard. Everyone in this room was told that this was student led. However, our first meeting consisted of an hour long lecture where the agenda was present by adult facilitators. We were quickly divided by the shape and color of stickers and didn't get a chance to connect with our fellow equity ambassadors and thoroughly discuss what we wanted to see as a group. This continued to happen for the next three meetings. We got 10 minutes per section that was assigned by adults. And then when students were able to give feedback in each section, on each section, we were roughly given 30 seconds for each station. My experience was a pure example of the lack of student voice. Last month's meeting in December, I was told that I would be able to speak on behalf of the equity ambassadors. However, when I decided to make a public comment, I was not recognized to speak with the student equity ambassadors. In that moment, I felt so small and unheard. I felt like I was dismissed just because I had a differing opinion. Second, I encouraged the MCCSC school board to take this policy, to table this policy due to the very fact that after the policy has passed, it's very difficult for it to be amended. This means that we need to make the policy the best that it can possibly be, possibly be for the first time around. I would also like to highlight that there are other there are no repercussions or consequences in place in the rough draft. Although the policy does mention restorative practice, the idea of restorative practice as a disciplinary action isn't yet 
an established practice in our schools. Therefore, before adding it to the anti-racism policy, it needs to be an all over disciplinary action um, in multiple um, events. Overall, the Student Equity Ambassadors Program had good aspects. However, it also didn't properly pro precipitate what the fellow student body wanted. School board members, if you care about the well-being of our small population of Black, Indigenous, and people of color and the student voice, you will vote to table this policy until the requested changes have been made. I'm aware that the vote of this policy was moved to February. However, I believe we should come together to make sure we can create this policy the right way by February. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Molly Barwick and then Amy Morwick after that. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Molly Barwick. I am a volunteer with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. I'm here tonight just to say thank you to Dr. Housewell, to Dr. Finley, and to the school board for adopting a resolution for safe gun storage. Um, in adopting that resolution, I see that NCCSC is further strengthening and amplifying the values that you've been practicing for some time now. So thank you for taking this important step to um, forward for gun violence prevention. Thank you. Amy, and then after that, Jamie Noble, teacher. Hi, can you hear me okay? Um, as one of the Equity Project team members for MCCSC, I wanna take a moment to thank a few people with regards to our recent body of work towards creating a draft racial equity policy. First, to Dr. Hoswald for his leadership and support. Throughout this process, you have been available to answer questions. You have listened to educators, our students and the community regarding their thoughts on the important topic. And you have provided productive feedback to our equity project team with regards to log logistics of developing this document for MCCSC. So thank you. A special thanks to President Schur and members of the board for giving us the opportunity to create a policy in such a way that is innovative by incorporating student voice from the very beginning. To our students who spoke in May, thank you for being brave to bring attention to racial inequities so that we can then collectively collaborate to expand your original concerns in a way that makes a policy that is meaningful for all of our students, educators, and families. To my equity project team colleagues, the educators who are part of this work, and all of the student equity ambassadors, many who you see here tonight, thank you for your tireless efforts and hours spent on co-developing a racial equity policy draft in response to some of the concerns of our students within our schools. We could not be more proud of the work that our students did and their willingness to be vulnerable as they shared their lived experiences with race within our society and our schools while providing ideas and suggestions for how best to combat racism. To be sure, not every student that we serve feels racially safe in our schools and we must double down as educators to improve their experiences and to disrupt any and all instances of racism that occurs in our hallways, classrooms, or extracurricular activities. It is because of this that we must continue to move forward, putting forth this comprehensive racial equity policy as the first of many steps towards making safe and inclusive schools for our MCCSC community. Lastly, a very special thanks to Dr. Winston for her leadership, guidance, and nonstop support. I can guarantee you that through every step of this journey, Dr. Winston has made it very clear that our students, their racial safety, and their success in our school communities is the number one priority. She ensured that students were not only present, but were involved in leading the way throughout this process. She continues to lead with grace, kindness, and patience as we navigate this complex societal topic. We as a community are extremely lucky to have her leading this important work. Our work to maintain racially safe and inclusive school settings will continue to be a priority as we work through a lot of the initiatives through the strategic plan. I am extremely grateful to be a part of a school corporation that supports these efforts to make our schools safe for every student that enters our schools. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Jenny, and then after that, Ariana McCoy. Jenny? Uh, Noble, the chair. Yeah, you. you. Um, my name is Jenny Noble Kuchera, and I first want to thank uh, President Schur, Dr. Hauswald, and the MCCSC 
Board of Trustees for listening to our concerns. Um, I have been duly elected by the members of the Monroe County Education Association um, and also appointed uh, by our president. And I would like to read to you the first half of a letter um, on behalf of the Monroe County Education Association membership. Um, we're talking to you tonight to bring your attention to our concerns about the district's recent purchase and implementation of educational technology. We've brought our concerns forward through the lawful discussion process, and the administration has faithfully listened to our points and allowed us to exchange ideas. However, we feel that our essential concerns are not being resolved, and we want you to hear them as well. Currently, all K-12 MCCSE teachers are following the written expectations for supporting learning during student absences, which specify, and I quote, instructional learning resources and student assignments must be available and posted on Canvas no later than 30 minutes after the end of the student day. Uh, last semester in December, MCCSC administration clarified this mandate for secondary schools. For any classroom containing a Teams board, um, Teachers are expected to turn on the equipment and broadcast a live feed that the absent student can access. Here are our concerns about this. Number one, student privacy. The cameras capture in-person students' faces and voices, and all students will be live streamed in every class. So there's no practical way to prevent students from being shown or heard. It's impossible to ensure a student participating from home is also not recording the class on their own device. These videos could then be posted online in any format, and we feel that this would open the door for a variety of student privacy concerns um, in both directions. In addition, during online instruction due to COVID, most teachers observed that a majority of students are uncomfortable participating through video or audio. Knowing that all classes are being streamed um, and potentially recorded is really likely to reduce students' willingness to participate in class, and this would ultimately decrease the quality of the in-person instruction that we could provide and also reduce students' sense of safety at school. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Next, uh, Ariana, and then um, Donna and Kate. Hello. I joined the Student Equity Ambassadors because I was tired of being the only POC in my higher level classes. I was tired of having to constantly correct my teachers or peers when they said something problematic. I was tired of having to be the other in every space that I was, went into. I was just tired. Through this policy, I hoped to end my and others' fatigue. No. I'm not gonna stand here and pretend that if this policy gets accepted tomorrow, or I guess Thursday now, I won't have to um, walk into my classes tomorrow and deal with that. On Thursday, I know that I will still be one, if not the only POC in my class. That being said, I do think the policy is a good start. Having a policy means we can start writing guidelines to specifically target issues that we are seeing at MCCSC. Guidelines that will describe how MCCSC will work to recruit more staff of color or what progressive di discipline would actually mean. And if they don't, I know that me and many others in this room will be up here months from now arguing for those to be edited. The policy itself is not gonna fix the systemic issues in the school. It won't stop students or faculty members from saying racial slurs. It won't put more black kids in Alps and it won't abstain MCCSC from racism. It will, however, be a start to a very lengthy process that will hopefully end many years from now and a safer, more inviting, and equitable MCCSE. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Donna. Thanks, Kincaid. And then after that, Joanne. I'm sorry, I'm trying to read everyone's name, so I apologize if I don't say your name right. Uh, Joanne Otterstrall and Jeanette Decker after that. Hey, thank you, um, President Scher and Dr. Hoswald, MCCSE Board of Trustees for listening to us. Um, mine is the second part of Jenny's uh, letter. My name is Donna Burnens Kincaid, and I've been duly elected by the members of our MCEA and appointed by our Monroe County Education Association president to read a portion of this letter to you. So I have the second and third concerns um, connecting to the video streaming. 
Our second one is the live streaming a classroom is not an effective instructional technique. Majority of MCCSC classes are not centered around a teacher lecturing from the front of the room. Best practice for instruction in most courses is for students to be actively engaged in learning through direct individual or group work. When students watch live classes online, they tend to become passive viewers, essentially watching a poorly made instructional video. MCCSC teachers learned during COVID that hybrid classes are not effective for remote students. In response, teachers purposely have modified um, their online coursework so absent students can participate in daily assignments as active learners. The modified practice includes personally recorded videos, professional learning resources such as Khan Academy and Crash Course. Our third concern is an assumption that using that technology is simply and will not, um, is simple and will not detract from the quality and function of in-person instruction. This is just not true. Setting up a meeting properly to ensure at least some level of meeting privacy and prevent inappropriate behavior by students requires checking multiple settings. Online instruction during COVID revealed many issues with video streaming classes. Many students are students, uh, many of our students um, during COVID did not um, interact with, with the video as demonstrated by the difficulty of having them even turn on their cameras at home. Knowing that all classes are being streamed and or recorded is likely to, sorry, to reduce our students' willingness to participate in class, decreasing the quality of in-person instruction and reducing our students' sense of safety at school. This newly clarified mandate from MCCSC administration has alarmed many teachers across our district. In response, our building association representatives have voted unanimously to bring this issue to your attention, and we thank you for hearing our concerns. Thank you. Uh, Joanna or Joanne, and then after that, Janet Decker. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for hearing me. My name is Joanne Audrich. I am a parent of three sons who went through the MCCSC system, and I'm here to address you about the proposed changes to the um, ALPS program. Uh, I also serve on the High Ability Committee as a uh, uh, person at large formally as a, a parent, uh, nothing against um, wanting to make things better, wanting to make things more accessible. Uh, what I find concerning, and this reflects my, my opinion, the opinion of some teachers, former students, and other concerned parents, I do not appear here as a representative of the committee. Um, we are concerned that we just discovered about this, in an email on the 18th, we had a quick meeting yesterday. And I think what concerns us most is this program isn't broken. It doesn't mean it can't be better. It's an extraordinary program that meets the needs of many, many students by law. I think what's bothering us the most is the lack of transparency and the quickness with, what, with which this um, decision came about, how no one was really notified until fairly quickly. Uh, the most important thing is, I think we feel we need to slow down. This program that's been in place for over 30 years was put in place by Dr. Janet Spazari. It got there through many years of research and um, a lot of change that had to occur, a lot of education. We think that time needs to slow down. You need to hire uh, qualified teachers in gifted and talented education. You need to work out a support system for the students. These are not just smart kids who can ace all the tests. These are kids who are twice exceptional on the scale. They're on the right side of the curve. They make the scores go up. That's really great. But they're really special kids. They do have special needs. A lot of them have quirks and, you know, little things that make them very special behaviorally. They need the support to survive and thrive. People need to be educated. The system has to be in place. They have special needs such as advanced math. Um, university school right now does an extraordinary job at that. They've been doing it a long time. They've been uh, looking to improve and do better things. This program is accessible to all children. Kim Williams did an excellent job in her tenure in trying to educate the um, 
teachers give alternate methods of identification of gifted, gifted and talented children, especially in underserved populations, and getting the teachers up to speed, particularly the K through two. We're just encouraging you, please, this is a very special group of kids. They are special needs. We need to treat them with respect. And we also need to get that in place. So please Thank use you. the resources Thank you, Janet you Becker have. next. Thank you. And after that, Sorella Hunt. Good evening, Dr. Hauswald and board members. First, I'd like to thank you for your service. I'm a parent and extremely grateful for our teachers, school leaders, and many employees who make our schools excellent. My comments are about agenda item 6.07 and specifically about ending the ALPS programming at University Elementary. I do not oppose the proposal, but I'm curious whether the proposal has been carefully analyzed and what the unintended consequences for ALPS may be. According to the National Association for Gifted Children, gifted students require modifications to their education. These additional supports are similar to the specialized instruction needed for students with disabilities. Additionally, there are numerous twice exceptional students who are identified as both gifted and have learning and other disabilities. There are many myths about gifted kids, but one is that they do fine without differentiated instruction taught by specially educated teachers. Gifted students can struggle, become frustrated, and ultimately hate school. Additionally, many gifted students have unique social emotional needs. When I heard that there is a proposal tonight to end ALPS programming at university, I was curious why. The stated reason is for increased access and equity. Like me, I would imagine everyone is in support of increased access and equity in gifted education. According to multiple researchers, students of color and students from low-income families are continuously underrepresented in gifted programs. This is a significant problem that must be addressed. However, what I've been curious about for years now is why our district only has one location for elementary Alps. In many neighboring and comparable districts, more than one elementary school has gifted classrooms. For example, Bartholomew County has two schools with fourth through sixth grade classrooms. The benefits are many, but mostly having multiple Alps locations allows more access and equity so that more gifted students receive the specialized programming that they need. If the district ends Alps at university, it won't affect my family, but I have had firsthand opportunity to observe university's Alps program for many years now. I encourage the board and district to take time to carefully review this proposal, study the potential consequences. In the past, Alps was moved from university, but then because of the problems, it was returned to university. University has a long established and outstanding program with a needed infrastructure and highly trained teachers. If it is moved, there is a serious risk that many of the features that make it so effective will be lost. I'm sure there are many in the district who know much more than I do about what would be good for kids. And I strongly encourage you to seek input from multiple stakeholders, including teachers, parents, and school leaders. I also wonder why the district would want to move gifted programming instead of replicate and expand upon university's established and successful program. Thank you. Thank you. Cirilla, and after that, Sean Cooper. Good evening, board. Cirilla Helm. Um, I'm not on the agenda tonight, so I'm taking public comment to uh, give you guys a few things that timing-wise are happening with the foundation but won't be happening at the next board meeting. <laughs> so um, we are, uh, we've, we've been a charity partner selected by Old National Bank for their 100 Cooks Who Care program. Um, and we were supposed to be that partner in 2020. Guess what? No event in 2020, 2021, 2022. And now finally, 2023, the foundation and Wonder Lab are Old National Bank's community partners and our goal is to raise $200,000 that night. Um, we are currently in need of chefs. Um, a lot of people, when they hear the word chef, they think that we go to the restaurants in town and we pull chefs from the restaurants and they come and they cook. That is completely not true. Um, chefs are just people who are passionate about these charities and they want to support and engage and enrich children in our educational community. Um, so my husband is a chef. God help us all, but he is. Um, so the chefs are cooking. He will be cooking. I've warned him he has to cook his own thing because I cannot do it for him that day. 
Um, but he's great on the grill. So it'll be something off of the grill. Um, it's very easy to sign up as a chef. You go to the 100 Cooks Who Care website. Um, it's 100 Cooks Who Care Bloomington, I believe is the way it is. Uh, you can find it on mine. But I encourage you, and I'm actually here to encourage the school board to be a participating team in this. Um, we have opened it up. You do not have to do it on your own. You can be a team. Um, we have a team of principals, by the way. I would like to thank Lisa Roberts, Chris Ben, uh, not Chris Finley, Stephen Marshall, his replacement at Child, um, and Andrea Mobley and Courtney Ladyman. I knew by trying to call by name, I was going to get myself in trouble there. Um, but those four individuals, Adam Terwilliger is on a team, um, as well as Tyler Abel. I'm sure there are other inside of MCCSC that I'm just not exactly aware of, but I would like to ask the boards to consider becoming a team. What you do is you pick a fun cartoon theme because that's the theme this year. You dress up, you get crazy, and you have fun. This is not a staunch stiff gala. There are no heels required, no ball gowns required, no hairdos, none of that. You're just having fun and you're raising money for two great charities who are both in the education space, by the way. Um, so that's what I'm here for. Anybody else in this room that would want to be a chef, please come out. We are inclusive. You've noticed they've dropped men who cook no longer. It's now an inclusive event. So chefs can be from all walks of life and so can guests and everything. So uh, you're also agreeing to fundraise for them in a peer-to-peer -peer network. So I encourage you, February 25th is the date. Um, so there you go. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Next, Sean Cooper, and then after that, Olivia Jordan. Um, hello, my name is Sean Cooper. I'm a student athlete at Bloomington High School North, and I'm a part of the Student Equity Ambassador Group. Um, going into this, my mom wanted me to do it, and I said, why not? Sat here for like three and a half hours, eating pizza, not to it, but with it was opportunity for change and this was a great opportunity for change but also know that this is one step of very 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 many many more and I think with this should it also bring um like she said a little bit more student voices um you know everybody's a little controlled in today's society in the education system because Teachers, they're adults, you know, principals, they're adults, but, you know, kids are the ones going to school and they see this stuff every day. And there's a lot of racial activity, sexist activity that goes on. And, you know, equality is a big part of the society and something that needs to be addressed a lot more often than some other things um, from unfair punishments to racially profiling people stuff like that. And um, I do think with this, with this policy um, needs to be a change. I mean, it's many years of the same thing, a lot of talk, not a lot of action. And I think it's time for action. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Olivia Jordan. And then uh, after that, Gloria Howell. Hello board. Hello, board. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to find my voice in the. There we go. Ooh, I hate hearing my voice in a microphone. Um, hello, my name is Olivia Jordan, and I am a teacher at Bloomington High School North. Uh, prior to being a teacher, I was a student, and I actually have grown up in the MCCSE, well, okay, the Monroe County School Corporation, uh, since I moved here when I was six. Um, I first want to acknowledge the hard work that students have put into creating this policy because without their voices, there would be no policy and you all are incredible um, and never, never stop doing what you're doing because look where we are now. Um, it was very evident when we, short, when we began sharing our stories um, that this is an issue in our school district. And although at times it may be subtle, it is something that we shouldn't, we shouldn't be bonding over these unfortunate experiences that we've had. Um, I came back as a teacher because of some of those experiences and because I wanted to help be a voice 
and help make these changes. And that's, it's very near and dear to my heart. Um, I, I do understand that the anti-racism policy is the first step in a process of addressing racism in our school district. Um, and I, I'm really proud that I'm able to help contribute to that. And I reflected a lot about what I wanted to say uh, before you here today. I thought about sharing stories and um, really what I want to bring to light is the reality that in our country right now, there is an attack on education and racial discussions in education. And we're seeing it every day. And I think to pass this policy says something about our community. It says something about our school corporation that we do, we do not want to tolerate those behaviors in our school district. We want to, I mean, ideally eradicate it, but at least start taking these steps to give these students the support that they absolutely deserve and the support that I wish I could have had when I went to school here. Um, I think what we say in passing this policy is that we care about creating a safe and inclusive environment for all students. It says that we will strive to address the issues that our minority students and staff face rather than shying away from them. This policy will reflect the values of both our school corporation and our community. And as I said, I would have loved to have this opportunity and this policy when I was a student. Um, I understand that the next step are the guidelines and I, I wanna speak it into existence. So I really hope that those are the next steps that we're able to take and that we can really outline those procedures and um, set that expectation across our school district that we are not tolerating racism here in any way. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Gloria and then after that, Chris Jeffy. Thank you, Gloria Howell, Connections and Social Action Chair for Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated Kappa Tau Omega Chapter. Greetings members of the MCCSC School Board and Administration. As members of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, we believe in the importance of elevating the voices of marginalized populations to improve their social stature. This belief is reflected in our sorority's mission to cultivate and encourage high scholastic and ethical standards, promote unity and friendship among college women, study and help alleviate problems concerning girls and women, maintaining a progressive interest in college life and to be of service to all mankind. By listening to and uplifting the voices of those who are often overlooked, we can create a more just and equitable society. It is our responsibility as members of the MCCSC community to collectively work toward this goal and ensure that every student has the opportunity to succeed and thrive in a safe and inclusive learning environment. While we appreciate the efforts of the MCCSC administration to address these issues through the proposed equity policy 5518, we believe that this policy is not yet ready for adoption by the board. We strongly encourage the revision of this policy in consultation with the students expressing concern to ensure that it adequately addresses their needs. We must make it clear, very explicit, that racial harassment and bullying will not be tolerated in MCCSC schools. We stand with the students and organizations like the Monroe County NAACP and encourage the MCCSC school board and administration to join us in our efforts to create positive change within our schools. It's our shared responsibility to work together to create a more equitable and inclusive environment for all students. Thank you, Monica Johnson, President, Capital Omega Chapter, Gloria Howell, Connections and Social Action Chair. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Next we have Chris Jeffy and then uh, Julius after that. Good evening, my name is Chris Jaffe. I'm reading this statement on behalf of Russ Skiba, who's an IU professor emeritus and father of two grown children who attended school in MCCSC. While not representing any group this evening, I strongly support the efforts of the NAACP on the racial equity policy. The emerging collaboration between them and MCCSC on this can only bode well for our students. I also applaud the district for making disciplinary disparities part of its equity agenda. It may not be an easy conversation, but acknowledging the issue is a critical first step. The most recent data from the US Office for Civil Rights shows that black students in MCCSE 
are three times more likely than other students to receive in-school suspensions, 2.1 times more likely to receive out-of-school suspension, and three times more likely to be expelled. Similar data on the state's website suggests these findings are not confined to this year or one year, but a consistent issue here. In my work in this area, I've seen many districts facing such disparities. So I hope you won't mind if I share some thoughts on what seems to contribute to success. First, successful districts realize that tackling this issue demands a dedicated effort over time, not simply one or two meetings or a single policy change. It takes persistence, patience, and a commitment to meaningful change in policy and practice when needed. Second, successful districts seek out local partners to assist them. We're blessed to have active local chapters of the NAACP and the Indiana Coalition for Public Education here. At IU, at least four faculty researchers have worked on this issue, both nationally and in Indiana. MCCSC schools and students will benefit greatly from the achievement involvement of these community and university-based resources. Finally, basing data on racial disparities is never easy. Afraid of tarnishing the reputation, some districts go to great lengths to avoid sharing their disciplinary data, leaving no alternative for advocates but to submit FOIA requests, a process that can be quite divisive. In contrast, successful districts understand the truth of James Baldwin's words that, quote, nothing can be changed until it is faced, end quote. MCCSC's efforts so far suggest that it will indeed choose the path of transparency and responsiveness. In closing, the presence of disparities does not mean that MCCSC, its teachers or its administrators are racist, only that there is something that needs fixing. Indeed, facing current disparities and committing to undoing them is the first step in being anti-racist. Current inequities rooted in a history of oppressive oppression and discrimination may not be our fault, but as caring individuals who wish our schools to be fair and just, they are our responsibility. Thank you for this opportunity to share my thoughts. I'm happy to work with you and others in any way I can to help address this critical issue. Thank you. Next, we have Julius Hanks. And after that, Paul Farmer. All right, good afternoon. My name is Julius Hanks, and I should have got here earlier because I have former students and some friends and colleagues who've done a great job tonight. Um, I know I'm on the clock, and today I'm here in support of the racial equity draft. And with that being stated, um, although I'm an educational professional, um, I am here as a community member, somebody who's also been a former administrator here for this district, worked in K through 12 in Atlanta public schools, and currently works for Indiana University School of Education. In those different roles, I've seen many different things. And I remember moving here in the early 90s. I remember people touching me and asking me, why are you brown? I remember a neighbor asking me if my parents sold drugs. I remember asking, I remember writing a, a, a feedback form to my science teacher explaining to her how she was racist. Although she didn't do anything to me, I saw what she did to my friends who looked like me. I, I mentioned those stories and, then, and don't go into great detail because those are the reasons we need this racial equity plan. Those are, we need a policy to support things. Because once again, being a K through 12 educator, I would drive to school in Atlanta and I would see my kids on the road and it broke my heart because I wanted to pick them up. Why did I not pick them up? because there were policy and guidelines that were in place that would have me lose my job if I picked those kids up when it was raining. Policy, just like getting a speeding ticket, it encourages people to know what the laws are, to know what the culture is, to know what you are expected to do. And I think that our kids, our students, they don't only need that, they deserve that. And so that, that is why I am here in support. And also too, after going to some conferences and looking at policy, it is really, really important to understand that there has to be policy before there are guidelines and implementation. So what I challenge all of us to do, and especially the administrators here, are to hold MCCSC accountable, accountable for doing that, to make sure that there are guidelines in the implementation, to make sure that what we say we stand for as a community and as a school system, we support that. 
and um, that's upon us to hold them accountable. So um, thank you for the time today. It's great seeing so many familiar faces. You all have a great night. Thank you. Next, Paul Farmer, and then after that, Sydney Crosley. Thank you, President Scherer, Dr. Hauswald, and the school board. Uh, my name is Paul Farmer, and I'm the association president for Earth Our Teachers. Uh, I was going to talk about two things, but the first one kind of went down because Jenny and Donna already talked. Um, so I was going to kind of introduce them first, and, and I'll have a conversation, and I'll talk about discussion and stuff in February, um, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. The second thing I wanted to talk about today is I, I wanted to take a moment to, uh, first of all, say some things for uh, Dr. Winston and her team. Um, with the racial equity policy that has been brought to you, we've had our first reading, we've got the second reading. I've been around 35 years. I've done a lot of policies, <laughs> a lot of guidelines involved in all the things that I do. And I will tell you, I have never seen the entire encompassing of so many different groups of individuals. We may not all agree with what, how it went through and so on, but, but the students, the parents, the teachers, the administrators, the entire community, I mean, there has been tremendous input and that's because of her leadership and Dr. Hauswell's leadership with getting that together. And, and I think that's incredible for us to recognize that, you know, I even made a comment to her one meeting was, I wish we had started filming this back when the students first started going and, and filming it, because I have never seen it. I've never seen it like this and it's incredible. So that's, I, I wanna say thank you to, to her and her uh, leadership. The other thing I wanted to talk about was just being involved with policies and guidelines. You know, the, the policies tell us what we want. What do we want for our MCCSC, for our students, for our community? It tells us what we want. That's what this policy does for us. It tells us what we want. The guidelines have to come after policy. That tells you how do we get there. And that's what has to come next. I've done this before where we've done them both at exactly the same time. And they don't, they don't work well together because one says one thing, one says something else. That you have to have the guidelines second. So that that way it, be, it, it, it allows you to fulfill what you're wanting in your policy. And, and therefore they actually talk with each other. Um, so I, I think that's one thing I've, I've heard a lot. And I'm, you, know, you guys know I'm here at every meeting. Um, and, and I hear a lot that a lot of, of students or parents or community members, well, how are we gonna make this policy? We're not gonna accept it until we know how. Well, that's called the guidelines. Those are coming. I know Dr. Winston and I have already started talking about it, about how we're gonna involve students, parents, everybody again. And that's what we do. So just want to say thank you, board. Thank you. Next, Sydney Crosley. And then after that, Deb Fish. Hello, I'm Sydney Crosley, and I'm a sophomore at Bloomington High School South. I'm here in regards to the racial equity policy. I previously spoke um, to the school board meeting back in May with three other students. My experience as a student equity ambassador has, lot, has had lots of positive things, but has also let me down. In the first part of the meetings, facilitators explained that the meeting would be student-led, that there would be a policy written for us to critique, and that we would be able to contribute our ideas to. Although that, that was a promise made to us, it did not reflect on what we actually did as student equity ambassadors. The most important and crucial parts of planning the policy were rushed through and not prioritized. Other promises were made, such as creating an anti-racism policy, but instead we were left with the racial equity policy. Those two titles are completely different. And when students sat down and helped draft sections of the policy, we felt dismissed and not valued. With that being said, I am asking you, school board members, uh, to table this policy so we can better the policy for all MCCSC schools. With the policy being tabled, we can make take clear steps to better the policy. I want to see meetings that are shaped by student voices. Thank you. Thank you very much. Deb Fish, and then after Deb, uh, Taji Gibson. Good evening. Debbie Fish. 
where is it there? Debbie Fish, retired educator. So we're going to go back in history, my history, a long time ago, when I was seven, a long, long time ago. And my family moved into a brand new house in the new community of Eagledale, a white middle-class June Cleaver kind of 1957 place to live on the far west side of Indianapolis. And for fourth and third, third and fourth grade, I went to the brand new school that I could walk to just one block away. At the end of fourth grade, I qualified for special education. Now that name has morphed into high ability or gifted or ALPS in the here and now. This program was housed in an older school located closer to downtown Indianapolis with more access for all the surrounding areas and where their demographics were much more diverse and there was no transportation provided. My mom and a few other moms took us every day for two years. My neighborhood friends didn't have a clue why I changed school and still lived in the same house and a few of them taunted me with, Debbie's going to a school for dumb kids. That perception was hard to change. Well, I love that school, my teachers, my new friends, all the wonderful educational experiences. I made friends at recess I would never have made at my old school. And we all benefited. Um, and that was literally a school across the tracks. So Alps moving to Fairview, I support that. It reminds me of a book one of my IU professors in special ed wrote. Her name is Dr. Ellen Brantlinger. And this was called Dividing Classes. It was about that period in Bloomington history when Elm Heights was closed and all those kids were redistricted. Anybody here around back then? Probably not, you're all too darn young. Well, it was traumatic, traumatic. So her book, Dividing, Dividing Classes, How the Middle Class Negotiates and Rationalizes School Advantage. It can be bought on Amazon. Her husband, who I called today, can't even find his copy, nor could I. The book description, in this study of the school system of an Indiana town, Ellen Bratlinger studies educational expectation within segments of the middle class that have fairly high levels of attainment. Building on her findings, she examines the relationship between economic class structure and educational success. We as a community need to decide who we are. Are we interested in equity or are we just interested in ourselves? Thank you. Taji Gibson, and then after that, Brina, Brina Moore. Good evening, everybody. My name is Taji Gibson. I've been in education for way too long, 30 years almost. Um, one is an, um, an administrator at Tri North Middle School. And in my role as an administrator over the years, there have been times where I've had to speak to our students about the ways in which we speak and treat one another. And those are often courageous conversations to get our young people to understand thin and thick lines of prejudice and in many different forms. And policy is needed to gird those conversations, not only with our young people, but also the adults in our building. And those girls who walked up to the microphone last year, I appreciate them and I thank them for their time and what they did. And I appreciate their stories, but, and I appreciate that the fact that we have a policy now that was created and started by them and for them, and that policy has the voice of the students of the MCCSC, which is the contending voice that really matters. And it's important that we pass that policy and that we look at that policy and that it has meaning because we need it, particularly as a black administrator in this district, one of four black administrators in this district. And the other one, one of them is in this room. 30 years ago, you if you could have shadowed me in my high school experience, you would have seen a young black girl who did not have a sense of belonging from her teachers or administrators for an equity policy of any kind was not in the minds of educators who surrounded me. I struggled throughout the formative years of my high school experience and those struggles 
prompted me to ground my dissertation research on whether or not black girls in suburban schools felt they had a sense of belonging in their schools. And although I am finished researching, I am not finished writing, but I know what the answer is. And I'm sure you do as well. When policy is enacted, we can then create guidelines that support policy. And you've heard that a couple of times tonight, but I really want you to hear me on that. That's policy 101. Create the policy first and then create and act, and act guidelines that ensure implementation. It's a multi-step process. If the board votes down the policy, and they have, but, but there's hope, right? What is the plan to help address the concerns of the girls and us brought up a year ago? Do we go another year without a policy while we fight over semantics? To, pass an, to not pass an equity policy sends a message to the students and the community that this issue can wait. And I don't think that we can wait. Thank you. Brina Moore, and then after that, Hopi Strasburg. Hello, uh, my name is Brina Moore. I'm the parent of a freshman at Bloomington North. And I wanna first acknowledge all of the students that have spoken already this evening. And thank you all for your hard work and contributions and for the members of the board that have listened to their stories patiently and are taking action. To the student equity ambassadors, you should all be extremely proud of your work and contributions. You've chosen to take action, you've demonstrated vulnerability and helped influence positive change that is long overdue in our district, not just for yourselves, but for your younger siblings and all the future students coming into MCCSC. May this be the first of many opportunities for each of you to have a seat at the table where decisions are being made. The purpose of this policy is to confront and mitigate and eliminate racism and to value, respect, and honor the student voices. I've heard some stories tonight that have altered what I'd like to say today, and it sounds like there's still a lot of work to be done in this. But I stand behind this policy not just because it acknowledges that racism does exist within our school system, because I assure you that it does, but because your students and your students of color have spoken and told you what's happening in their classrooms and within their offices and the schools. Before moving my family to MCCSC in 2016, I painstakingly selected my son's school, basing much of my decision on the diversity metrics present on each of the school's websites. I saw the accolades uh, celebrating diversity, and so I made my decision confidently. I was so sure that my son would be valued for his individuality, respected for his culture, and that he would thrive in this environment. Soon after, I realized that an anti-racism policy, such as the one we're mentioning tonight, did not exist. My family was subjected to multiple instances of racial bias and microaggressions. And I won't dwell here because some other stories have been shared tonight. And that's, I wanna move past that. I want us to move forward with the policy being proposed tonight. As a mother and as a person of color in this community who considers myself fairly well-versed in matters of diversity, equity, and inclusion by profession, I confidently advocated for my son and our family fighting for corrective action. I recognize my own privilege in these circumstances and that many families systemically may not have access to the same resources or support system that I did at that time but I am encouraged by the efforts made by the district today to start the work of removing some of these systemic barriers. Through this policy, MCC acknowledges that racism is an issue and that it is a barrier to our children's education and that there are disadvantages for some of our students, for many of our students. But hear this, this is just the first step of many. For those of you that believe there's more work to be done in this policy, you are, you are correct. And this work should never be complete. It would be gravely disappointing to see no further addendums or amendments to this policy year after year, because with every new student that comes, they bring a new unique experience and their voice should be heard like the others in this program. Thank you. Thank you. Hopi Salzburg. And then after that, uh, McQueeba Reese. Hey, <clears throat> good evening. Uh, my name is Hopi Stasberg, and I want to make a comment about the proposed move of the ALPS program from university to Fairview Elementary. Um, I've been a university parent for nine years, uh, and I have been, uh, I have a background in education, and I've been an extremely involved parent at university for seven of those nine years, serving in various leadership positions in the PTO. And I love university. And I say that 
to uh, so that you know that I really know the school and I know the teachers and I know the students and I know the families I've had a lot of experience with them. And hearing this proposal uh, brought up some concerns and some questions that I really hope have been considered and can be addressed later on in this meeting. So first, uh, the question is, have the current stakeholders been adequately involved in this conversation, specifically referring to the teachers of Fairview and of university, including ALPS teachers, including special area teachers, because the culture of school at Fairview will change and it will take intentionality on, on behalf of the Fairview teachers that are already there to make that change successful and for it to not be a school within a school culture. And it is not enough to make this decision and then say to the teachers, okay, you guys figure it out and get on board. They need to be on board and part of the conversation before the decision is made. And my understanding is that may not have happened. So maybe we need to slow down the thought process on this. Second, uh, the proposal reads like the real problem is transportation. And there's a lot of really good logistical reasons to move a district-wide program like Alps to a centrally located school like Fairview. And that might be really great, especially since Fairview wants to open up or you're proposing to open up the arts, artful learning program there district-wide. That could be a really interesting thing that would solve a transportation issue by having both of those uh, schools of choice in the same building. But if this move is mostly happening to solve a transportation problem, just be transparent about that. Okay, I beg for transparency in general. And last, I'm going to tell you a little story about school culture, um, which is uh, a little hard for me to tell. So as I said, I've been in university as a parent for nine years, and I've had two kids go through that building. One was in Alps and one was not in Alps. And as an educator, the Alps program is not a good choice for all students. It's just not. And I know that. I'm confident in that. The school does a great job to create that cohesive community to make one school, not two. It's not always a good choice. But as a university parent, I can tell you there is othering that happens between Alps and not Alps. And when my older kid was in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, I was the president of PTO. And I would be out in the community and uh, parents would introduce themselves and they'd say, oh, what, what teacher does your kid have? And I knew in that moment that when I answered, my answer was going to tell that parent, mm, her kid's not an Alps kid. And I would frequently get that look. Okay. And if you've been othered, you know that look. So please consider that moving the Alps program will mean changing the culture of Fairview. And Fairview has worked really hard on their culture. And I don't want the Alps program to mess up what they've created in that school. Thank you. Lastly, we have McQuiva. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to love each other. It is our duty to support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Asada Shakur. Hi, my name is McQuiva Reese, and I serve as the Monroe County NAACP president. The time is now to stand firm in anti-racism policy in the light of the devastating, horrific, hate-filled crime that has taken place across the country and in our community with anti-Asian hate ongoing targeted, racially motivated, and that is anti-Black violence. We do not make room for oppression Olympics. We wanna see progress in policy. I'm thankful to be up here to talk on behalf of the NAAC branch as we've created a subcommittee that have advocated and listening, listening to young thought activists. In response to students who have since last spring have raised awareness of racial discrimination and race-based bullying in MCCS schools, the Monroe County NAACP, therefore known as branch afterwards, has released a statement urging the MCCSC board of school trustees to delay a final act, a final vote on its proposed racial equity policy. For branch applause and supports the students who have courageously brought the attention of the community to highly disturbing instances of racial harassment in MCCSC schools. In response to the MCCSC administration announced the formation of the student equity ambassador program at the August 2022 board meeting and worked with ambassadors to draft racial equity policy 5518 which received its first reading in December. The branch is encouraged by the initial draft of the racial equity policy, but shares the concerns of others in this community that it merits strength, strengthening in a number of areas and is not yet ready for adoption. We therefore urge the MCCSC board to delay final vote to allow time for thoughtful review and community input. We make this request mindful of the need of balanced, timely progress with the desire of racial policy that addresses the concerns. I believe this action is in support 
and very appropriate as we've recently approached Martin Luther King Day. Dr. King taught us that our institutions must be, hold themselves to high standards in the struggle against racial injustice. But Branch looks, forward, looks forward to a time when all students can thrive in our MCCSC schools and offers its opportunity to support helping MCCSC strengthen protections against race-based bullying. As strong advocates for public education, the branch is willing to work with MCCSC school board to develop policies, consequences, and accountability at every level to produce a sustainable infrastructure free from racism and discrimination. We are grateful for MC Monroe County residents that have joined the branch in calling for the policy demonstration and a firm commitment to ending all types of racial discrimination in MCCS MCCSC schools. We are motivated to work alongside alongside all champions of equity who desire a strong and sustainable policy. We believe that with such clear and unwavering message, it will impact generations to come. Thank you so much. Thank you. That concludes uh, our, our public comment portion. Thank you all who came. Uh, thank you for spending uh, an hour and 10 minutes with us tonight. I appreciate your voices and thank you for coming. We will now move on to uh, the consent agenda. We'll give you a second if you need to move around. By move around, I mean if you want to leave. <laughs> we encourage you to stay. The cookies? No, just Conversation building. Conversation building. Uh, yeah, there is. All right, now for our consideration is the consent agenda that includes the following minutes from the board meeting held on December 13, 2022. Minutes from the reorganization meeting held on January 3rd, 2023. Overnight and out of state field trips. Financial report, December 2022. Appropriation balance report, December 2022. Register of claims, January 24th, 2022. Payroll register and payroll claims, December 2022. Do I have a motion regarding the approval of the consent agenda? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. It has been moved by Ross, seconded by April, that we approve the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor of the motion to approve the consent agenda, signify by saying aye. 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 Against, no, any abstention, motion carried. Next for our consideration are the donations. We have received donations of over $1,500, and we'd like to thank all the generosity of our donors. Do I have a motion to accept the donations? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. It's been moved by Kathy and seconded by Ashley that we accept the donations as presented. Oh, who are you? No, okay. No, okay. No, no. All those in favor of the motion to approve the donations, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against no. Any abstentions? Motion has carried. Just a reminder that we have uh, tabled uh, the racial equity policy. And next for our consideration is the personnel report. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel report as presented? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. It's been moved by Ross and seconded by Aaron that we approve the personnel report as presented. And Dr. Salbaum will share this with us. Thank you, President Schur, Dr. Hoswald, and members of the Board of School Trustees. This evening, I would like to recognize three retirements included in the personnel recommendations. Deidre Larsh is retiring in May as a social worker from the Bloomington Graduation School and the Academy of Science and Entrepreneurship after educating students at MCCSC since 2002. Crystal Elkins Rowland is retiring in February as a corporation bus driver after supporting students at MCCSC since 2010. And James Miller is retiring in May as a choral aide at Bloomington High School South after supporting students at MCCSC since 2000. Thank you retirees for the many years of service to our corporation, students, and community. This concludes the board personnel report. I request that you please approve the personnel report as presented in the board packet. Thank you. Do we have any comments from the board regarding the personnel report? All right, thank you, Dr. Salbaum. All those in favor of the motion to approve the personnel report signify by saying aye. 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 Against no, any abstentions? Motion carried. Next for our consideration is the recommendation to adopt resolution 2023-03, commencement of board district 
modifications. Do I have a motion to adopt resolution 2023-03 as presented? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. It's been moved by Kathy and seconded by April that we adopt resolution 2023-03 as presented. I will now open this discussion and dialogue to the board for any comments. I'll just say that, um, you know, I'm grateful to Moms Demand Action who have sort of tirelessly advocated for You're on a different wrong. wrong. I'm on the wrong one. How did that happen? Sorry, um, but you did make a motion the... for a different one. <laughs> Whether uh, what is happening? No, no, that's fine for the the board <laughs> the board district. Oh, the redistricting. Yes. Okay, I'm moving ahead of myself now. Um, no, I think um, this has been on our sort of radar for a while. We wanted to wait until. We had new board members on board, obviously, because, you know, we didn't want to make a decision like this without um, sort of having the the sort of uh, approval of everyone on board. But um, I'm glad that we're doing it. I know that it's going to be a really long process, but uh, maybe. Why are you making that face? I just know that it, it, I encourage people to read the resolution. I think it really gives details into the. Um, and again, this is the, the, this is truly the privilege of the board, but it does give nice details into how long it's been since the board uh, entertained this process. And so I was thinking through the fact that it, it does have the, right. the, the timeline of that, um, but also being mindful that um, there is a somewhat of a timeline because of the goal I think the board has stated to have this approved by the 2024 elections. So it, it is a, 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 those I was just thinking of those different dates in my mind. No, nothing else. <laughs> Any other comments from the board yeah. um, on Brandon. the board districts? Um, out of curiosity, who, so as we go down this and looking at the data, who's going to collect and collate that data? Yeah, we will actually hire a demo, like a, we will hire someone that will, that does this for a living that will okay. find the data, collect the data, and then show us the data as a board. Okay, so it's, and, it's, and, it's and a third party that's going to do Yeah. It's a good question. It's really, uh, again, the privilege of the board, but I do know that um, um, we consulted um, with the, with the standard contract, and you'll see tonight um, that we will be posting on behalf of the board a call for proposals, a request for proposals, and then it'll be the board that will we'll look through those and, 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 and um, interview and, of course, decide which ones you're interested in. But that process will start tonight as we share ideally with university folks. We'll make sure we get that out to the board members too. So if, if you have uh, people that you know in the, in the, you know, in, in, in the community um, that may have that experience. Um, okay. So it's an RFC process. process. Yep. Okay. Any other comments? I'm glad to see it happen. I was on the board when they first started talking, the community brought it to us. And um, now that I'm the one that has the most experience mm -hmm. on the board that way, you're my second term, um, but uh, a wide swath of our community came and really want, were interested in, in finally addressing it. And it is odd that <clears throat> I think this is the only body of elected officials where you decide to reelect or redistrict yourselves. And I'm glad that we're open and willing to do that. Anyone else? Why not? I'll jump on yeah, the bandwagon. Why not? I'll break my, I'll, I'll, I'll break in. I just, I'm really excited for this. Um, as Kathy mentioned, I was one of those people who was advocating for that back in, I think, 2017 when we started having these conversations. So to see it um, get another look and a serious effort is, is great. Great. Thank you to the board. I uh, Hearing no further comments, all those in favor of the motion to adopt resolution 2023-03 Commencement of board districts modifications as presented. Please signify by saying aye. 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 Against no. Any abstentions? Motion carried. Next for our consideration is the recommendation to adopt resolution 2023-04, safe storage. Do I have a motion to, to adopt resolution 2023-04 as presented? Yeah, so oh. move. So Do I have a second? Give it to second. <laughs> okay, it's been moved by April and seconded by Kathy that we adopt resolution 2023-04 as presented. And Dr. Housel is going to share some information with us. Um, the, the resolution is posted. Special thanks to Moms Demand Action. I know that we had the opportunity to, to engage with them and have a conversation. We appreciate their advocacy or the role you play in this. Uh, you'll, you'll be able to read the resolution and, and clearly see some of our um, 
be it resolves versus our whereas is and and then the be it resol resolves um, have conversations about um, education that, that we will be putting information in our handbooks uh, this summer and um, we'll be providing information to families and really working together and outreach into the community um, and to other organizations to do um, everything that we can do to make sure that our um, that our families and our relatives and people in our community safely secure the weapons and the guns should they decide to have them. So thank you again for bringing this to our attention. Thank you. Are there any comments from the board? Yeah, in the spirit of a uh, full disclosure. Um, no, honestly, I'm sitting here and you know, I take notes while people give public comment. And it's been a really long time since I ate. And in the spirit of transparency, oh. honestly, I'm so hungry right now. And I was thinking about butter chicken <laughs> because I know that's what my wife cooked at home. <laughs> For a second, my brain was like, okay, we're moving on. But honestly, I, I am really grateful to moms for their um, tireless advocacy and for, you know, continuing to sort of knock on the door and to um, bring the safe storage um, stuff to us. And I think, you know, as, as a parent, as a board member, this is something that clearly we're all committed to, um, to keeping our kids safe. And so grateful for this resolution, looking forward to butter chicken. Thank you very much. Any other comments from the board? Who's going to follow that? <laughs> Not I. <laughs> Thanks for bringing up buttered chicken. I appreciate I that. I buttered chicken last night. Lots. Oh. Okay. Any other comments? Along. Yeah. From the board? Okay. okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hoswald. All those in favor of the motion to adopt resolution 2023-04, safe storage is presented. Please signify by saying aye. 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 Against no. Any abstentions? Motion has carried. Next, we'll move to contracts. Do I have a motion to approve the contracts as presented? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. It's been moved by Ross and seconded by Ashley that we approve the contracts as presented. Mr. Kenny will share that information with us. Good evening, President Schur, Dr. Hoswald, members of the board. There are 12 contracts and one bid to be awarded before you tonight. I recommend approval of the contracts and bid award as presented. Do you have any comments from the board? Thank you, Mr. Kenny. All those in favor of the motion to approve the contracts, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against no, any abstentions? Motion has carried. The next item for, re, uh, for consideration is the authorization to bid. Do you have a motion to approve the authorization to bid is presented? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. It's been moved by Ross and seconded by Kathy that we approve the authorization to bid as presented. Mr. Kenny? Thank you. For action this evening is the authorization to develop specifications and advertise for bids for instructional supplies and equipment janitorial and paper supplies, furniture, buses, maintenance vehicles and equipment, fuel oil, gasoline, diesel fuel, and all major maintenance projects included in the 2023 operations fund. The recommendation is to authorize business office administration working with administrative staff to develop specifications and advertise for a variety of items and projects. Thank you. Do you have any comments from the board on authorization to bid? Okay, thank you, Mr. Kenny. All those in favor of the motion to approve the authorization to bid is presented, signify by saying aye. 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 Against no, any abstentions? The motion is carried. Next for our consideration is the recommendation to adopt resolution 2023-05, transferring account amounts for the education fund to the operations fund. Do I have a motion to adopt resolution 2023-05 as presented? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. It's been moved by Kathy and seconded by Ashley that we adopt resolution 2023-05 as presented. Mr. Kenny. This resolution is required by state of Indiana statute. It authorizes the transfer of amounts from the education fund to the operations fund in calendar year 2023. In 2018, the state of Indiana had school districts set up two new funds, the education fund and the operations fund under Indiana code. The education fund is set up for the payment of expenses allocated to student instruction and learning. The operations fund is for the payment of expenses that are not allocated to student instruction and learning. Indiana code requires the distribution of tuition support to be received in the education fund. 
this transfer of an amount not to exceed $15 million from the education fund to the operations fund is to reimburse the operations fund for expenses that are not allocated to student instruction and learning for the 2023 calendar year. I recommend approval of resolution 2023-05. Any comments from the board? Thank you, Mr. Kenny. All those in favor of the motion to adopt resolution 2023-05, transferring amounts for the education fund to the operation fund as presented signify by saying aye. aye. Aye, against no, any abstentions? Motion is carried. The next item for consideration is item 6.07, elementary programming and pay changes for 2023-2024. I'd like to thank the administration for their continued work on meeting the board's equity goals outlined within the strategic plan. I fully support this recommendation. And as board president, I would like to make a motion that we approve the elementary programming and pay changes for 2023-2024 as presented. Do I have a second? Second. So moved. It's been moved by myself and seconded by Ashley that we approve the elementary programming and pay changes for 2023-2024 as presented. Dr. Hoswald? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, board, and good evening again. Um, just a few comments. We tried to put as much information on this recommendation as possible. I would uh, like to especially thank our administrators uh, who have worked hard um, over the last 18 months as the board began the process of creating a strategic plan um, we began to see these themes related to equity and diversity, and we're going to have a pretty significant and serious conversation later tonight about our diversity goal number two, and that's the disparate impact um, in ways that we're working to, um, to reduce what we call the risk ratios. Um, as for um, equity goal number one, and that is increasing access and choice, um, after we did a presentation, of course, in um, August, and I know our first focus with, uh, uh, with cabinet member uh, Terwilliger was focused on simply getting our students to school on time and the massive changes that had to take place in transportation. I kind of gave an update and I won't reiterate that, that um, we still um, struggle with meeting the demands of transportation, but we are doing so in a way in which our students are all, um, we're meeting that challenge in a way that our students are no longer late to school. We made significant improvements to that um, and we can share some of that data um, at, at, our next, at our next meeting. And so then that allowed us to turn our focus on to uh, uh, access and choice within our equity goal. And as we began looking at that, we started with some conversations with our administrators and some of them are more programmatic. Um, of course, uh, um, Mr. Um, Mr. Rockhill from Highland Park had come to us and asked about creating a program at Highland Park. He believed that uh, others had uh, an approach to learning um, that he, uh, and, and working with the staff, brought us a request for the International Baccalaureate Program, which you'll see listed. In additional conversations, we began looking at how do we begin to provide students choice in a way that is uh, manageable and sustainable with our current transportation um, restrictions. And we're confident, as we currently do, that we can provide choice to one of our schools for now, ideally more later. Um, and by putting it in a centralized location, um, we believe that that is the most efficient, effective way to meet that need. In doing that, we realized that um, we also had to make some additional programmatic changes. Um, and that included moving the ALPS program. We started with conversations with Mr. Goldburn and as well as uh, um, with um, the principal at universities, Mr. Hopkins, both of whom support this recommendation. And they both have supported this in different reasons. Part of that is that uh, they, they understand our goal of, of equity and increasing access. Part of it is they do understand that there's some educational research um, well-grounded in this, a desire to create greater socioeconomic balance in our schools. We've talked about that a lot. We know this will accomplish that. Um, we had conversations, of course, on, on with both principles, one relating to space and accommodations, the other relating to the work that had been done and how we make sure there's a smooth transition. Um, we also had conversations with our teachers association, and then we had conversations at each of our buildings. We met with, uh, um, with, with the administrators in the district, had conversations with the, with the teachers, um, and to understand concerns, we made some adjustments. One of that was that we don't move the program all at once, that we create a three-year transition plan so that the students that are already in the program won't, be, um, won't have to move school a second time if they moved to school to, a, to attend the, the ALPS program. Um, so after those conversations, we also uh, ensured at the request of some of our staff that we not force any of our teachers to move. We felt like that was a fair request. 
and began making some adjustments to this. And then as a result of that, we landed um, with a recommendation that basically said, we're going to create a transition and assign new students, students that have not yet been identified to, a, to the, an ALPS program with the same director as we work to train, ideally, it may be the teachers that will choose to transfer, if not train additional teachers, just like we've built a program before so that um, we can create a quality program um, um, for our high ability students uh, at simply a new location, as mentioned by some of the families um, and, and by some of the citizens, we know this is the right thing to do. This is gonna create greater socioeconomic balance. We know that when a high ability program um, is in a school, it, it creates benefits. And we've heard university parents and, and faculty mentioned that there's a benefit to university. There has been for, um, for a long period of time. We know that that benefit will extend and, and apply to Fairview as well. Um, so in my heart, I believe that's it is the right thing to do. It accomplishes many goals. And I can't find where it's, it's detrimental um, 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 to our students and to student learning. And I believe that this is one step we can make that is doable given the constraints in transportation. So tonight you see a recommendation to open up Fairview uh, for students throughout the district. And we do that by uh, moving the trans, uh, the Alps program, adding grade three, moving grade four to university, to, to, from university to Fairview, and then adding one grade level per year until it's through sixth grade. Um, we've had other concerns. Some of them are process-based. Some of them are, you know, what testing we use. And so I really do appreciate that this, uh, this recommendation has brought forth a lot of concerns that maybe we have not heard. And that allows us to address, you know, like, how are we going to test? How do we make sure we remove bias in the testing process? How do we add multiple tests? You know, those tests existed regardless of where the students attend. And so the nice thing about this is this has created a, actually a, a, a richer and more in-depth conversation about um, our um, high ability program. And it allows uh, people like Dr. Prinker and our, our, our current director of the high ability program to take some of that information aside from the process and aside from where it's located, and continue to make this program uh, grow and, and, and be better. So um, that is part of the recommendation you see tonight. The second one is, is, a, is a fairly unique uh, approach to strategic staffing. And we uh, cited some research here. It clearly supports the concept of paying high, higher salaries to teachers who work in high uh, poverty schools. Um, if you're interested in the public and you take a look at this recommendation, you can see that approximately on average over the last four years, three quarters of our new teachers have been placed in our highest poverty schools. If we wanna talk equity, we have to begin to find ways and means by which our best and most experienced teachers work in some of our highest poverty schools. And this is just a step. We had a question, is it enough money? Well, um, the answer is we don't know. We have to start somewhere. We started with, of course, just like with the, um, the, 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 the opening of Fairview and the movement of Alps, we started with the MCEA. In this case, we started with the MCEA because we are using uh, funds, of course, that uh, can be used for other types of bargaining. And uh, we believe this is an investment and we um, and, and discuss this with them. And ultimately the goal is to get this percentage down, right? And we don't want three quarters of our, our beginning teachers assigned to our, um, to our highest poverty schools, which we define here as priority schools. So what does that amount look like in the future? Um, we don't know, right? We don't know, maybe this will address it. Maybe this will prevent beginning teachers in their first three to four years that are doing an amazing job at a priority school. Maybe it'll, it'll um, incentivize them to stay at those schools. Maybe it'll incentivize some of our uh, um, highly effective, as the state likes to define uh, many of our teachers, highly effective teachers doing a great job um, at some of our uh, less complex schools to choose to transfer to these. And perhaps uh, that, that balance will require slightly additional money. And if so, we'll have more conversations with our teachers union and with, with, uh, with teachers in general. So strategic staffing is, this is the first step, but we do believe it's another tool that we can use to really address some of the inequities that we see here uh, at MCCSC. And then lastly, we mentioned as we uh, aim to increase programmatic opportunities, um, the, the additional piece we have is adding International Baccalaureate School at Highland Park Elementary. So I do believe strongly, I appreciate the amazing amount of, uh, of input we've received from, um, from, um, from our administrators and from teachers. Um, and we do uh, recognize that in, in the example of the Alps, we have not identified the, the students that will be impacted, but we received a, 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 an email from a, um, from a community member asking, um, we wanna make sure that we still have in place a process by which students who qualify, they elect not to go into the high ability, ability school 
that they have the ability to um, receive um, differentiated instruction for high ability in their in their general elementary classroom. We've always done that, and we continue to do that to meet the needs of the, of the students where they are, whether they choose to uh, attend um, an ALPS program or not. So I thank uh, everyone for the feedback. Um, I do believe this is very research-based and aligns very closely and well with um, the, the board's uh, equity goal number one. And in return, I think we'll see some benefits with related to equity goal number three. And I would ask the board to pa uh, pass this, re this recommendation as presented. Do you have any comments from the board regarding the elementary program and pay changes for 2023-2024? Yes, Ross? I've got a couple couple things that came to mind as, as I'm listening. In, in general, I, I'm very supportive of the idea as well, but citing transportation as one of the cogs in this. How is it going, is it going to present a challenge though for the next two years while we're still transporting ALP students to university and engaging in transporting ALP students and artful learning to Fairview? Uh, no, we don't believe so in the short okay. term. Um, and then the culture of Fairview, that, that school is a very unique school and has a very high priority population. Is this going to, are we going to maintain the level of support for those priority populations that are already there? And is ALPS going to be incorporated into that overall culture? Or, or as one commenter said, is it going to be a school in a school? How, how is that going to be incorporated with the Artful Learning? So the answer is we'll always continue to invest in our priority population. So that won't change it at Fairview. I appreciate that question. And then the second point is that uh, when we work with the principals and the staff, much like we did at university, we will work to incorporate and, 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 and um, create a ideal uh, collaborative learning opportunities uh, between the programs, right, within one school, just like we've done at university. We heard a lot of people talk about the successes because of that. And I would not uh, expect the, the staff at um, Fairview to, to do any differently than, than what we've done elsewhere. Any comments from the board? I, I, I do. I have a couple comments and then a question. Uh, my first comment is when we talk about transportation, I think it's also important to remember that um, currently where um, the program sits, it's quite far away from some of our other schools, and that is a determinant and whether someone would enter their child into that program. Um, and I've heard from parents who said that they did, in fact, not enter into the program due to that travel distance. So I like to keep that in mind when we're also thinking about transportation constraints. It's not just, you know, it's a shorter bus ride. It, it does impact people not entering into the program that would otherwise benefit. So I think that's important. The, um, the second thing I would, I would just like is that I, I did hear some concerns about the arts grant being potentially in jeopardy if it moved here. Can you just confirm that it's, it's going to be safe and um, there's not that concern? Well, um, it's not our understanding that it would be jeopardized, uh, of course, uh, you know, in terms of grant readers, but my, uh, our commitment is that if, in fact, um, we will find a way to continue um, the funding levels needed to make sure that our art for learning continues to, to exist and, and grow and be successful. So thanks. any other comments from the board? Yes. Um, <clears throat> so I think a couple of things, I mean, you know, I've, I've read every letter that's come in, um, all of the comments on Facebook. Uh, I'm a, I'm a pretty, you know, I, I tend to do my data gathering both from the community and from um, beyond in terms of research, you know, what this looks like, where it's been done in other districts, how we move forward. Um, I know that the district itself and the administration has done an incredible amount of work and thinking and planning. This isn't something that just um, happened overnight, even though sometimes it appears that way. Um, I think as part of our equity goals as a board, um, and this is something that I think is very much in line with that, but also as part of a, a sort of broader equity plan you know, that there are lots of things coming this year that will move us toward greater equity and included in that is a socioeconomic balance in our district, which we sorely lack at this moment. Um, you know, I, I hear the concerns. I have some of my own related to inter-school culture. I mean, if anyone has listened to the Nice White Parents podcast, um, you know, they talk about what happens when um, you have kind of in-school segregation. Right. And so we know that there are issues that are at stake here, things that 
potentially could go awry, but I also know that we have a program that works at university, but it isn't necessarily working for all students in the district, and it isn't creating the kind of access that we would like to see um, present in this district. And I think moving this program, it is not ending the program. It's, it's a shift. It's a move to a different school to allow different kinds of access. And one of the things that is important, I think, is, you know, university, we technically haven't allowed for sibling link. So that means essentially, you know, people can ask for their students to get moved. Occasionally it happens. Occasionally it doesn't. It doesn't always happen. It is not um, in our sort of the, the way that we've done things. It's technically not allowed. Um, and so what that means is that if a student moves into the ALPS program in fourth grade and they want their first grader to follow, there's no guarantee that that can happen, right? So I want us to just think about in terms of equity and access, if we have a parent um, who has a student at Fairview or Templeton or a school that is not sort of more centrally located to university and their fourth grader gets in to the ALPS program, their first grader has to stay at Fairview or Templeton or Highland Park or wherever else it might be. And that does create communication, I'm not communication, but transportation complications and issues for that family who might have less access than perhaps some of our other families. And so by moving it to Fairview, centralizing that location, providing sibling link, um, I think we do provide greater access to the families who need it. And I think that's really important. I also know that this isn't just about transportation. This isn't about solving a transportation issue. This is about solving an, ac an equity and access issue. That is what this move is. Ultimately, that's what's at the heart of this. It's in alignment with our board goals. Um, and so I recognize that this might not be a popular shift with many people in the community. Um, and for others, I've heard a lot of support. So it's not a decision that I think for myself that I'm making sort of lightly um, or flippantly or without enormous amount of thought and research. And I think the things that we have to do as a board and as a community, right? If we are concerned about whether or not this program will flourish in the school or whether or not there will be these culture issues, that's up to us to ensure that those things do not become issues, right? How do we sort of um, ensure that when this program moves into the school, that we're fully prepared. How do we support our administrators? How do we support our parents? How do we support our students? And I know that, you know, for instance, PTO monies, right? We see time and time again, when we look at donations, we know that Fairview often gets the least amount of donations. I remember one time watching Rogers Binford, Childs get hundreds, thousands of dollars. And I remember this moment because Fairview got $200 in a pair of shoes, right? We know that the power of PTOs can go a long way to bringing resources into schools as well. And those resources can go to making the, the student um, experience at Fairview different. Yes, there might be a culture change, a culture shift for all of us in that community. And it can be a really good thing if that's what we intend. And so I just, I think that's what we have to get behind here. Any other comments from the board? I have just something quick. Um, I, I definitely support this. I think I share April's sentiment that, um, that I'm cautiously optimistic, but I also trust that this is just the first step and I trust the administration to um, you know, work on these issues of culture and transition over time. And sort of in that spirit, if this question is too granular, feel free to punt it. But I was with that sibling link, I'm wondering, will that include transportation for siblings that are in the ALPS program? Yeah, that is our plan. And, and again, by increasing access and choice, we, we have the, the buses going out to pick students up um, from the district, um, space provided, of course, but then that allows us to do sibling link with transportation, something we haven't done before. And I appreciate board member Hennessy bringing that up. I forgot to mention the sibling link point, which is which is important. It's been a barrier. And and back to your point, um, we we have heard lots of time um, in generalities the, the changes in culture. But I think that um, what I heard um, board member Hennessy saying to in some of her remarks was a reminder to us all 
um, that it's it, that it's it's really impossible to know what that change is going to look like until we implement it, and that not all these changes in culture are bad. Thank you, by, by the way, for the question. Thank you. And for allowing me to clarify. Any other comments, Erin? I just wanted to say, um, and April had kind of already made the point that I was going to make about PTOs. I, I you know, working um, at a school that does have a lot of priority students in the past and being a parent at, of a university child or children, um, I think that's a very valid point that you bring up. Um, I also, I'm in support of this as a university parent. I know there's a lot of comments I've seen on um, social network today about how it will have a negative effect on university school. And I, I feel fully comfortable that, that this won't be a problem. I feel like, um, I feel very com confident knowing that the administrators of both buildings are in support of this. And I think that it is just another step of making a more equitable experience for all of our students. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot of um, positives about this. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? Okay, all those in favor of the motion to approve the elementary programming and pay changes for 2023-2024 as presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against, no. Any abstentions? The motion has carried. Dr. Hazel will introduce tonight's presentation on diversity goal number two, student discipline disparity. Uh, yes, uh, um, board, we're, I, I know we, uh, we're pushing into the third hour, but we have a really important conversation and we look forward to engaging with the community on this. And, you know, uh, as a reminder, we'll put the schedule up here in a little bit, but once a month, we sort of do an outward facing public presentation and a bit of a deep dive on one of our goals. We have nine goals, two of them sort of stack in funding. So we really have eight goals we're going over this year. This is our fifth goal. This is uh, diversity goal number two. But what you hopefully will see is that we have a continual process in place by which we gather data, we, we sort of present that, have conversations with the public, then use that feedback and input to begin going back and, and drafting recommendations, solutions, and improvements. I think what you just saw in that conversation was a result of originally data and information we shared back in, in September. September. I think I said August earlier. So um, you, I hope you're beginning to see a, a rhythm and a cycle. Tonight is a very important conversation and a very timely conversation based on what a lot of uh, our, our public comments were based upon tonight. So with that, I uh, turn it over to uh, Dr. Winston, who will be presenting on diversity goal number two. Thank you very much, Dr. Hoswald. Um, I'd really like to begin by going to the next slide. And just for the record, um, my time will not begin until the conclusion of the video. <laughs> Dr. Winston has been really, uh, she told me she was going to stop the clock tonight every time one of you asked a question so that she knew what her time was. <laughs> In seconds. <laughs> So it really was only a few seconds. So I, I want to say thank you to Dr. Hoswald for a couple of reasons. And I guess I can speak about him while he's out of the room. <laughs> I, I want to thank him for the foresight in establishing a strategic plan. A strategic plan has not existed in this district for I don't know how long, since prior to my arrival. Um, when I arrived, I inquired multiple times about where's the strategic plan because a strategic plan drives your direction. It drives what you prioritize and it drives your actions. And so I thank him for that foresight to do so. And when he approached me and asked me to direct the work on diversity goal number two, to decrease, decrease disciplinary disparities between student populations, um, I also was very honored uh, and yet I knew it was a very lofty task. Um, why does that matter? It, it matters significantly in so many different ways that I'll, I'll oh, I forgot to start my timing. Um, so that was just a preload, right? <laughs> so it, it matters in a lot of different ways. When you talk about discipline disparities across this country, we know that African-American males in particular are four times as likely, according to the 2016 Office of Civil Rights, to be excluded and suspended or expelled from school. We also know, which, um, well, we may not know, but African-American females are even more likely 
to be suspended or expelled from schools to a much greater degree than African-American males. That's why it matters. And so as we go through and, and look at, I wanna just kind of highlight briefly um, what I'm gonna talk about, I don't have sufficient time to talk about tonight. It, it, it deserves a much longer period of time, but I'm gonna do my best to kind of highlight a few, few, few pieces of information that I hope, it will, hope that it will um, pique your interest to want to know more. If you look at the September um, topic, access and opportunity, this goal directly interacts with that. If you look at October professional learning, you can't decrease dis disciplinary disparities without professional development. And if you look at December safety, racial safety specifically is vital. So I, I, I pause here to talk about the interconnectedness of the goals that our superintendent had the foresight to establish along with the board of trustees. Next slide. As we begin to talk about educational equity and the definition of such, um, our administrative team has adopted this definition. And as we spent some time looking at this particular definition, it really is an ideal. And I ask you to kind of look at it. I'm gonna read it out loud. And there are some pieces that are highlighted in particular. Educational equity is achieved when educational policies, practices, interactions, and resources are representative of, constructed by, and responsive to all people, such that each individual has access, and it's highlighted for a reason, can meaningfully participate, that's highlighted for a reason, and has positive outcomes. All three must exist in order for educational equity to be achieved. From high quality learning experiences that empowers them toward self-determination and reduces disparities in outcomes, regardless of individual characteristic and cultural identities. As we spend time talking with our building administrators about this particular definition, we ask them and our educators, as you look at this definition, what stands out to you? So I'm gonna pause 10 seconds and I'm gonna stop my clock and ask you to look at this definition and just say to yourself, what, what jumps out at you? What one or two words jumps out at you? It matters. As we talk with our building administrators, many times they will talk about access. They talk about meaningful participation. They talk about representative of and constructed by. And I often will talk about positive outcomes. That's what we're gonna talk about tonight with the, uh, about discipline. So if you go to the next slide, you're gonna see the topics that have been, and the outcomes that have been highlighted over the last several months presentations. I'm gonna talk about the last two at the very bottom that you probably can't see that are bold. And the first one is identify and reduce lost instructional minutes. If you're not in school, you don't learn. Lost instructional minutes. If we calculate the amount of lost instructional time that students who are suspended or expelled from school experience, we're talking about months, days, months, and years of in lost instructional time. If you contrast that with access to educational opportunities, such as who is participating in ALPS, since that was a hot topic tonight, who is participating in honors classes? Who is participating in um, AP? More often than not, they are not people or children that look like me. And, and if you're out of school, you have even less of a pop, uh, possibility of that. So that's another reason why it matters. So it's quickly becoming a way of life regarding the types of conditions that we provide in our schools. The second component there is to reduce the use of exclusionary practices. In-school suspensions, out-of-school suspensions and expulsions, particularly the two latter. Those are the things that this goal strives to achieve. I took two, two minutes of my time to talk about that because I need you to understand why it's so relevant. To be sure, as educators, we do in fact control the conditions of our schools. <clears throat> We're striving not only to meet these particular outcomes, but to also meet the bolded outcomes below. So as I go through the next seven minutes of my time, um, these are the three presentation objectives that I hope to try to highlight, if only briefly. One, I wanna share with you some preliminary discipline data 
Two, I wanna highlight some of our current efforts. And three, I want to establish what are the next steps. And I wanna do that by talking about the data, the professional development that's necessary, and the specific observable action steps that are underway and that are so necessary. Each of these three areas are quite complex. This is the implementation timeline. When Dr. Hoswald approached me and our team, um, he said what the goals were. We had conversations about when do we need to accomplish them. So this particular goal, diversity goal number two, must be accomplished by the 24-25 school year. In order for us to be able to do that, we need to have targets. We need to be monitoring that uh, with data on a regular and consistent basis. And during, the, during my remarks, I'm gonna briefly talk about school year phase one, which is the current school year, the 22-23 school year. There are four pieces. We began by doing a number of discipline data retreats with our principals, our assistant principals, our counselors, and our social workers. Why? You can't change the data if you don't know the data. You gotta understand the data. And I'm gonna talk briefly about how we began to understand the data differently than it's ever been understood before in this district. And we kind of pulled the sheet off so that folks could really delve in. Very uncomfortable conversations, to be sure, but conversations that must be had nonetheless. We conducted, uh, we had um, the Indiana State Board of Education attorney come and do a school discipline law seminar with every one of our administrators. Because if we're gonna talk about changing the outcomes, then we need to make sure that we understand the inputs. What's, uh, what's causing that? What does the law require? In, term of, in terms of due process, and how are we going to respond to that? The third thing I'm gonna talk about is restorative practices training. We began restorative, a multi-year restorative practices training initiative during the spring of 2022. Some schools had individually kind of been doing, kind of been dabbing in it, but we as an organization have a four-year plan whereby every teacher in every school will understand and be able to implement restorative practices. You see how each of these could be a full day workshop. And number four, ongoing discipline work groups, research and development. I'm not even gonna talk about phase two or phase three because we're not there yet. The framework that we use is the whole child support system. This should not be new to anybody, but I think the piece that we're gonna highlight most specifically tonight is the behavioral component on the upper right-hand corner. Um, although they're interconnected with the academics, as I've already kind of alluded to, and the social emotional piece. As you look at the outer ring of this framework, on the left-hand side, you see equity and inclusion, not just words. There are aspects of the work that are being done, and there are aspects of the work that are still to be done. On the right-hand side, you see the safety and the physical, self, uh, uh, physical health, and at the bottom, you see the database decision-making. We can't move forward if we don't have access to real-time data to make informed decisions. And if I can speak on behalf of our principals, that's what they want. They want to be held accountable, but if we don't provide them with the tools, i.e. the data in real time, they can't. And so this is part of our, our effort. So diversity goal number two, decrease disciplinary disparities between student populations. So that's the goal, but before we could even begin to tackle that goal, we had to establish whether or not disciplinary disparities actually exist in MCCSC, and that's what we did during our um, data retreats. What we also knew we needed to pay attention to is if they exist, what is the level of severity and where do they exist, and how do we find out? That has been the singular most specific charge of our discipline data retreats that have been ongoing for more than a year. Next. This just talks about the areas of data that we're looking at and why, and I'm not gonna belabor this piece, um, but there are three pieces of discipline outcomes across all grade levels. Um, and these are also the discipline outcomes that we must report to the state. In-school suspensions, out-of-school suspensions, and expulsions. What we've always done is number and percent of students but what we've never done is risk ratio. And that's what I'm gonna talk very briefly about. Um, and then how do we do those comparisons? Oh, it's lowered. Um, <laughs> across racial groups, gender groups, economic groups, students with disabilities, and English learners. Next slide. 
So this just shows you for the 2019 school year, which we recognize as a partial school year because of COVID, the numbers of students who experienced one or more in-school suspension, out-of-school suspension, and expulsion. The number that's most important for you for in-school is 401. That's the, uh, the uh, column to the left and the orange for MCCSC 401, which represents 3.5% of our school district. Out-of-school suspensions, we had 183 students experience that. And expulsions, we had 26. So I'm gonna break that down in a moment. Next slide. Before looking at our sample corporation discipline data, it's important to provide a high level overview of some trend data on suspensions and expulsions. Next slide. <laughs> no, it's actually not. Uh, this is important. <laughs> and I've told you why it matters. So this discipline data just kind of shows you a brief trend of the upper level is out of school suspension at the bottom is expulsion. It kind of shows you where we have been over the last nine years. That's relevant. Those numbers, the 183 and the 26, you've already heard me talk about. The red are the expulsions and the uh, orange are the out of school. So now I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a drive by on two really important terms, risk index and risk ratio. Trust me, nobody in the state of Indiana is looking at their discipline data through these metrics. These metrics are what we believe is gonna help us really accomplish the superintendent's goal. That's how you calculate it. Don't have time to talk about it. <laughs> Next slide. You're gonna to have to step out on trust. And uh, I know you're gonna stop the clock, but we didn't mention this, but this PowerPoint is on our website. We have links to other information. We are introducing the public to this and we're not trying to make light of it. I see people taking notes and things. So this information is on our website. This PowerPoint is there along with all of the PowerPoints we've presented. And so that if you want to just really focus in on one of these, if you have other questions, we're available. I just want to put that out there. Um, so, okay, Dr. Winston, sorry. Thank you. Um, so this slide I'm going to pause a little bit on because this is where I wanted to get to. Um, this slide is just a, an example of the kind of work that the principals, the assistant principals, the counselors, and the social workers are being asked to do, and they're being held accountable to do on a regular and consistent basis. So if you look at this, there's a lot of data here. And so imagine if I had 10 of them and Dr. Hoswald said, no, you don't have time for 10. But I have they one. They told the same story, so. I have this one. And what I want you to, to pay attention to, um, if you look at the, if you look at, may I stand up? If you look at this box right here, it says risk index. This kind of identifies, in MCCSC up here, African-American, we had 22 African-American students in the 2019-20 school year who were suspended out of school. That number, if you do the calculations from the prior slide, represents that our African-American students are 2.43 times more likely to be suspended out of school. Across the state of Indiana, almost 4%, uh, four times more likely. So we're better than the state, but we're not where we want to be. But that's not our goal, right? If you look at Hispanic and Latino, our, there's 12 students there. I should have said over here there were 22. Hispanic or Latino, 1.29 times more likely to be suspended out of school. If you look at our two or more races, two times more likely to be suspended. If you are calculating this data in a district, and as we indicated, most districts aren't, they're just looking at the, the, the sheer numbers. But this helps the numbers begin to make sense as to what's the likelihood. And that's what risk ratio is. It refers to the likelihood that one group is going to be impacted by an action more so than another group. That's why it's important. And I, and I wanted to kind of highlight that. On the far right hand, you'll see um, another blue box that says comparison group for calculating risk ratios to determine disparities. Well, the comparison group is the white population of students in our district. While we had 124 of them who were suspended outside of school, that is what we're trying to determine. Based upon your enrollment in the school, what's the likelihood that you're going to be um, suspended? So that's the kind, that's the level of detail that our principals are calculating by hand right now. And, and imagine how difficult and time consuming that is, but that's what we're doing. Next slide, please. So our goal ultimately is looking at the 2019-20 year. We want to do, we are doing risk ratio yearly comparisons 
And some principals want to do it monthly. And I said, you don't need to do that often. We just need to do it once or twice a year just so we know where we are and what we're doing. And then ultimately, on the right-hand side, you'll see school year 24-25, our goal is to get to a risk ratio of 1.25 or less, which means there are no disparities. So we're not there. That's a lofty goal, I'm going to be honest with you, because this is a historical problem that, that, we're, that we're experiencing. But we do think we can begin to make incremental reductions. If we just look at some of our preliminary data that is not in this presentation for the interest of time, we recognize for our free and reduced population of students, right now they are four times more likely to be suspended out of school. That's not acceptable. Our, I've already shown you the African American males, um, African American students, that doesn't include male or female. I mean, it doesn't break down male or female, but our schools are asked to break it down. If you look at two or more races, they are two times more likely to be expelled. The good news is those two numbers that I just gave as examples, we see it going down as opposed to going up. So what are we doing about this? The next slide really just says, do disciplinary disparities exist within MCCSC? Unequivocally, yes, they do in multiple areas. What are we doing to address these disparities? Well, that's really the bulk of the presentation. Um, and I'm only going to just uh, highlight a, a few pieces. A few years ago, Yale University wrote an article in which they identified lessons and suggestions for addressing discipline disparities in schools. In the research, they found that implicit bias exists in a lot of discipline um, aspects. And so it requires, next slide, it requires training. Go ahead and the next slide too. Oh, well, no, 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 don't. These are the five areas that work is happening in. Discipline data reviews, I've talked about, I'm not gonna belabor that. Safe and inclusive schools, professional development, that's big. Every counselor, social worker, principal, and assistant principal is currently going through a series of modules around safe and inclusive schools. What that is and how are we assessing whether or not that's happening in our schools. They have a timeline right now to get uh, those modules completed by the end of February. The next phase of that work is to then teach all our teachers. That's going to take time. We're going to be working with Dr. Stahlbaum to figure that out. Positive behavior intervention supports. You did a resolution. I'm absolutely not going to talk about that because there's not time. And then the racial equity policy work. We, we've heard a lot about that. So if we can go to the next slide, I'll pick it up. I'm not going to skip this slide. This is just examples of the work. We've created organizers for our principals. We've had data retreat workbooks, teaching our administrators how do you even go about doing this work? How do you talk about it when it's most uncomfortable to talk about? But it's, it's glaring and, and our principals are uncomfortable with the data to the point that they're like, I don't want this data for my school. So we're looking, they're looking inwardly at what are we doing to improve it? Safe and inclusive schools. Part of that work is what we're doing with the four-year plan, a professional development plan on restorative practices. We have a cohort of schools who are being trained as we speak. And at the end of the school year, there's going to be uh, on the professional development day, our secondary schools and their teachers are going to go through a full day of additional training, just the first portion of training. It's not the entirety, but it's exciting. Um, and this is why when he approached me and said, will you do this work and lead this? I was excited. Positive behavior interventions and supports. We are looking at that data as well. And always culturally responsive practices and procedures. Each of those could be a longer conversation, but I want you, when you have time to go back and look at this, because the safe and, and inclusive schools framework really speaks to the essence of what we're talking about across the board, social, emotional, physical, intellectual, and cultural. If you just read one of each, um, social, emotional, school and classroom cultures are such that students feel safe to express their personal identities and culture. If that's not about Racial safety, I don't know what it is. Um, schools and classroom cultures are such that students feel safe to be who they are and proud of their personal identities. You need to read these as the board and you need to read them as our community to know exactly what we're teaching our teachers and what we're teaching our administrators. And at the end of the school year, we will be conducting a self-assessment around the degree to which we are or are not doing this, not to indict our schools, but to help our schools make improvements. Next slide. Skip that, next slide. Skip that one too. This is some data about every, every October, we assess the degree to which positive behavior intervention supports are implemented within our schools. I, I apologize, um, board president, I know that I am over time. Um, 
No, thank you for continuing. Yeah, keep. Hey, go real quick. Go back. Don't skip those other two slides. Are good. Yeah, they are, but we'll do it. No, just do it. Yes, sir. Oh, yes. <laughs> I can't. Wait. No, this is good. So, okay. Yep. No, no, he wants me to go here. So I'm good. Please. Um, restoring practices. Speak. Well, and then this, he's not wrong. Um, this is really powerful because what we're doing, the work that we're beginning to do, we've been training our trainers. We're training folks in each, every building will have one to two folks who are trained to train the rest of the faculty. We're working with the building principals to talk with us about how do we want to get all of their teachers trained in restorative practices. We know that there's a research foundation about the benefit of restorative practices for reducing racial disparities in discipline. It's, a, it's, a, it's well researched. It's not a panacea, but it's one of the, of the mechanisms. And so across each of these tiers, is the work that we're focusing on. Tier one is about building and strengthening relationships. If I don't know you and you don't know me, I don't feel a part of the school. That's a piece, an important piece for tier one. So we've got to help understand, help our folks understand why that is so essential and why it matters. Tier two is how do you respond to conflict and harm? When there are discipline incidents in our schools and someone has been harmed, we've got to make sure that we're intentional with how we are caring for that person? How are we caring for that student? How are we caring for our staff? I had a staff member talk to me simply as recently as today about how he or she is spoken to by some of his or her students and he, he or she happens to be a person of color. Um, so how do we respond to harm for our students most specifically and how do we respond to, our, to harm for our, stu our, our staff? And then tier number three is, okay, let's say we kick them out of school, but how do you bring them back? How do you support them so that they can transition back into the school setting at whatever point in time? And how are we educating them on how to respond to differences? That's what that's about. On the right-hand side at a glance, that's the four-year game plan for how we're trying to get our teachers there. And we have a very systematic approach for doing that. The next slide is what I was about to talk about in terms of how are we evaluating whether or not our schools even have what's called positive behavior intervention supports. It's a system and a structure for how are we teaching expectations in our schools, how are we acknowledging differences in our schools, and how are we supporting students um, around behavior, and, and more importantly, how are we supporting our teachers and understanding it? It's a formative assessment that we do once a year, and it looks at seven core features. Um, I greatly appreciate the gentleman who spoke with us, who's a re local researcher in the area of discipline, and his name is Russ Skiba. Dr. Skiba is amazing in this area of work. Um, I've studied his work when I was in school, quite frankly. Um, but we do it every year in the fall, and it's conducted by our behavior specialists. Um, it is only a snapshot in time, but it assesses the degree to which our tier one features are in place. So this set of data here is powerful. So it, we began in 2019, to assess because when I arrived here, everybody said, oh yeah, we're PBIS, we do PBIS. And we, I wanted to see to what degree are we doing PBIS? Well, when we did it the very first year, 10% of our schools were actually implementing it with fidelity to the degree that was necessary. And our goal is to get to anywhere from 90 to 95%. Mitch Bratton has led this work for the last four years and I, my hat is off to him to applaud him for being consistent and making sure that this is happening. The only thing I wanna point out is take a look at it we went from 10% in 2019, and we're at 68% now. And if you remember what I said a moment ago, we want to get to somewhere between 90 to 95% implementation. You cannot begin to assess the degree to which you have culturally responsive, positive behavior intervention and supports until you get there. So this is just another indicator that we're not there yet, but it's hopefully you see it as promising that we're moving in the right direction. The board resolution, you did the resolution, you know what it is, but these are the things that are already happening as a result of your resolution. And here's an exa one example of this. Dr. Prinkert led this um, virtual equity summer series, a couple of, uh, 21, I believe, or yeah, 21. Um, and what you should remember about this is each of the presenters, nationally recognized presenters, were asked to incorporate the social justice standards into the trainings that they were doing. And I can't read my paper, but the people were Dr. Gloria Glass and McGillen, 
Dr. Goldie Muhammad, and oh yeah, from IU, from Dion, Dr. Dion Cross Francis. Those folks, if you don't know their names, look them up, but they're renowned researchers and experts in the area of equity and culture. And so that's just a, a, an example of how we have tried to do what you've asked us to do. And my last point is just around our racial equity policy work. We made every effort to center student voice. Did we write every word that a student said? No, that was never our intention. Um, did we try to align the work to student perspectives and their lived experiences? Absolutely, and if you have a chance to go to the website, you'll see some of that information. I don't have time to go through it tonight. Um, and I think the third piece that's important is around clarifying expectations and direction for how we respond when there's a, a violation, how we support whoever has been violated and how we educate the, the person who has offended. That's part of that work. And then the very next slide, and I'm almost finished. These are examples of the rough drafts that our students gave us at the top of the paper are the ideas, the concepts, uh, the examples of what our high school students thought should land in our policy. And the handwritten sections are what our sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, when they gave feedback to our, ninth, uh, to our high school students, these are the things that they said that they liked about it and things that they wanted to emphasize. And we did the similar activity with our teachers and our teachers union. And I think that there's a lot of good that has come and I appreciate the opportunity um, for more voices to be heard to, to make the uh, rec uh, requested modifications. And in closing, there are just a few community questions that I don't have sufficient time to answer, but I believe that all of the questions from the community here have been addressed either through my remarks or if you look at the resources at the end of my presentation, I think that they will be addressed there. In terms of staff feedback, um, how is MCCSC resolving situations where students may be acting out in the first place due to stress of home life? And will it be possible to receive face-to-face -face courses and training? Yes, every teacher in the corporation was required to participate in a full day training on microaggressions, implicit bias and discrimination, and how to respond and how to address that at our November 8th PD day. That is not enough. We recognize that, but it is a beginning. So that's one way in which we're doing some of that. And, and Dr. Stahlbaum is prepared to assist us in doing more. Staff feedback, some of the key themes that came out of what our staff said to us. They want to be able to dig deeper into the root cause analysis of the disparities that do exist. So everyone acknowledges disparities exist. How do we determine why they exist? How does the whole child approach help us focus on real time data with, through a systematic analysis and strengthening PBS? And on the right hand side are just a few comments from um, our staff members in terms of how they feel about the topic. And the very last slide, which is really the last slide, is our spring professional learning series. We are very excited that as part of our four-year plan around strengthening what we're doing through restorative practices, our high schools and our middle schools will participate in a three-hour or six-hour training on strategies for strengthening student behavior. One of the books that we've asked all of them to read is Despite the Best Intentions. Chapter three is in many ways, this book is representative of, of some of the experiences that our students and our faculty have talked about within our schools. If you haven't read this book, it's an excellent book. Um, but chapter three in particular speaks about the core of racial disparities in discipline. And so we're doing that as a book study to help all of us understand um, and to make sure. And then we also are doing the self-assessment that I talked about at the end of the year. In addition to this professional learning series, we'll, we will be offering our parent university and many of our parents within our community have asked for additional support on understanding diversity, race, racism, and discipline. And this next slide just has resources that are informing our work. It is not an exhaustive list of resources, but it's some of the key resources. And I just wanna say thank you for allowing me to go two minutes over time. I agree. <laughs> Are there any comments from the board? <laughs> Y'all, oh, I know, but I always have comments. I mean, mostly because I just want to, I'm, I'm grateful for the work that's being done. I, I always am. And, you know, I know that 
there's a lot of work to do. Um, but I'm just so, so glad to see this work happening. I mean, in fact, I have a story of my own, and that is when I was teaching, it was the first day of a new semester. I didn't know the kids well enough yet to know to know them. You know, I just, we were sort of going around the room talking about what we'd done that summer. And you know how it is, like, you just don't, you don't know the kids well enough. You don't know who's saying what. You don't know their voices yet. And I remember as we were going around the room, um, someone asked, like, what I had done that summer. And from some corner of the room, someone said, she was probably in a rice paddy this summer. And as a teacher, I had this moment where I thought, you know, there, there's that moment. If you've ever been othered in that way, there is this moment of, of shame and of, of sort of anger. And yet here I am sitting in front of a classroom of kids trying to figure out how do I respond to this, right? Do I just sort of quietly move on? Do I tell them what I did this summer? And I stopped and I said, um, I don't know who made that comment because I don't know you well enough yet, but we don't make those kinds of comments in this classroom, right? And, and it, for me, it was a matter of sort of protecting and advocating for the other students in the room who might be affected by a comment like that. And I remember talking to someone afterward and they said, it was a, as another sort of colleague, and they said, oh, well, you know, you just can't take those things seriously. But they are serious and we should be taking them seriously. But as a teacher, I didn't even feel empowered to know how does one maneuver in a situation like that? You know, is there, is there a system by which I can report something like this? Not so that someone gets in trouble, but as a point of education for our district, right? That these things happen in our classrooms because these stories, you've heard them. They happen all the time. And yet there is no way for us to sort of collectively know those things. And then as educators, how do we respond to them? What is our next course of action in a moment like that? And if we do know the student, if we can identify, what do we do? Because I do believe in restorative practices, right? I don't want to send kids um, out of school or out of the classroom. And I worked really hard in my classrooms to not refer as often as possible. But what that means is you do a lot more classroom management. And, and it is, as a teacher, you sort of juggle these things like, do I refer? Do I not refer? What's the consequence for the student? If I do, I know this is his last, you know, like check and he's out the door. It's complicated. And we're making those decisions in a split second in a classroom with a thousand other things going on and a thousand of other factors. So the fact that this district is now, you know, as a district talking about these things so that each teacher in each classroom is empowered and each student knows the process by which they can report such a thing and that we understand that there's a pathway um, towards, I guess, you know, these sort of anti-racist policies and practices and equity is huge. And so I know I'm talking a lot. I always do. I'm sorry. My last thing I just want to say is that systems are slow. I say this all the time, you know, because systems are made up of people. So changing a policy is hard, it takes time, it's long, but also changing the hearts and minds of people sitting in those classrooms who come from all different walks of life and perspectives, that's also slow and hard. And so it, it, it's this constant tension of we need change now and change takes time. And I just wanna sort of put that, that sort of tension out there because I know it exists, right? And that's it, that's all I have to say. May, I, may I make a comment? So two things in reference to what you said, probably three, confront and disrupt. We have to teach our educators how to confront what you experienced as a teacher. Yep. What I was saying to this African-American male teacher today, which I probably shouldn't have said that, um, but we have to teach educators how to confront and how to disrupt when that happens, mm -hmm. when it's directed towards them as an educator or when it's directed towards our babies in our classrooms. That's the first thing. There must be consequences. There actually currently are consequences when we are able to investigate, but we also have to be much more intentional about how we educate. So there's an instance where a student was racially bullying another student in one of our schools a few years, uh, two years ago to be exact, and it continued and it continued and it continued and the principal's like, this child must go. And 
that child unfortunately was expelled, but the reality is that student still needed education. They needed some repair and the students who had been harmed needed repair, they needed support. And so trying to balance all of that is, is part of what I hear you saying. And I, I hope and I believe that the work that we're doing will ultimately lead to some of those changes. And yes, change takes time, um, but we have to be moving. We can't be sitting still, not for one moment, because I was JL, I was Sabra, I was all of these girls. Um, I have been in their shoes and I know what it feels like. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? I just wanted to say thank you, Dr. Winston, and um, your your passion about this topic is evident. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you felt rushed. But I, I of course appreciate your brevity, but uh, but I do. Uh, I was happy to hear you speak on it, and um, and again, I just want to thank you for your passion on it. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? Uh, I agree. And, and I have to to commend Dr. Winston, and, and we have an opportunity to meet with our cabinet once to, once a week to go through these and try to go back and forth on, on, on what's too much, what's not enough. Um, and I think part of the conversation is that what we're hoping to show and demonstrate to the community is that we take these, um, these, we take these challenges seriously. We take the data seriously. We take our charge from the board, our strategic plan. Um, you know, I know that um, midway through the um, last year, um, or maybe towards the end of last year, about a halfway after the strategic plan, Every board member, every cabinet member came to me and said, you know, the best thing that we've done, the thing I'm most appreciative of is I feel we have guidance. We, have, we know what the board and we know what the community wants us to focus on. And we can focus on that work. And there are days when we get pulled from that. Uh, you know, maybe we're writing, I don't know, memos on, on snow days and, and, and those types of things. We know, right? But nonetheless, we always come back to these matters. And, and we've had uh, significant conversations. And, and, and the thing is, is, as Dr. Winston said, there's a lot of communities that aren't going to show this data. There are unfortunately even more communities that don't even know this data exists. You know, they're not looking at disciplinary disparity. They may not even know what it is. Um, and they may not be breaking it down by complexity, you know, free and reduced lunch and students of poverty, or by race, or by, um, for, for our students, um, um, with an IEP. And so we can go on and on and on. But, you know, this started and, and I, I was impressed um, and pleased to see that when we started and adopted the strategic plan in October 2021, within two months, Dr. Winston came to me and said, here's some of the PD. And we didn't want to get out ahead, right? We didn't want to get out ahead of the, of, of, of the conversations. But she said, we've got to start this immediately. And we started working with our administrators. So, you know, we, we have phase one. It's really a year and a half of that. work, And it goes back to professional development. It goes back to, you know, the story that, that, that the board member Hennessy shared. And, 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 and part of our, our is how do we respond immediately, you know, for, the, for your colleagues and how they responded and brushed it off. Um, we're working to educate our, our staff members, um, our administrators, our teachers, to know that's when we see something. That's, it's not appropriate to brush it off. We have to take it seriously. And those protocols are coming as part of our anti-racism policy. But so much of this rests on professional development and, and knowing and owning this data and not accepting the fact that, well, we're you know, twice as good as the state. That's not what we aspire to be, right? We don't notice our goals aren't about that. Like even with our graduation data recently, all of our, um, all of our populations that are broken down, um, we're, we're above the state graduation rate. We said, that's not good enough. What do we want to to achieve as a community. Um, and there's times when those comparisons are appropriate. But in this case, we want to be better than who we are currently. And so, um, you know, these were hard conversations. I know for Dr. Winston to have with the cabinet that she's having with the administrators and our social workers, our counselors, and the teacher training. But we also know that when we looked at some 10-year trend data, our suspension data rates are down, our expulsion rates are down. We know that even our, our risk ratios are, are declining. It's not where we want to be, but because we're having this professional development, and as you mentioned, these are all connected. Equity goal two and professional development, equity goal one and access and programming, um, equity goal three, we're going to talk about, right, which deals with uh, a learning loss and accelerating learning for all students. Um, all of these things relate, and I think that's why we're beginning to see movement. Our conversations around the strategic plan, uh, the board president's put me on a, on a timeline, <laughs> and uh, also why we're going to see forward progress as a as a, as a whole and not just in isolated topics. So 
you know, Dr. Winston's just the best, and, and I appreciate the, the presentation and the work on this. Sorry. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hoswell. Uh, I'll get more later. We'll see. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hoswell, Dr. Winston, and the entire cabinet for presentation tonight. Does the board have any comments or reports that they would like to share? Uh, I mean, I was at the, huh? my my first committee meeting for the uh, Alps last night, so I think everything's been shared that was said there <laughs> right at mm -hmm. this point. But there's a wealth of information um, that the people on that committee have, and I hope that they'll lean in and help us um, make this transition as good as it can be. Any other comments or committee reports from board? One. Mm -hmm. um, so you did hear the request that perhaps the board might have a chefs who cook or team. I am unfortunately out of town that day, but um, something to think about. Are you volunteering? <laughs> any volunteering. other? I'll, I'll just chime in that I am also unavailable okay. that day. You know, <laughs> oh kid, my god! Is there is any other their, board comments? Their birthdays, you know, they kind of come first. I'm on it. Volunteering. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, and finally, Dr. Hoswell, do you have any, any additional have, information? I just have six time? quick things. Oh, so, oh um, six so, so I can add a seventh, just so there's one for everybody. So uh, first of all, I just want to mention that tonight we uh, we did do a ribbon cutting and dedicate the remodeling and renovation of our transportation building. Special uh, thank you to Transportation Director um, um, Scott Waddell, as well as all of the staff members. And the nice thing is, and I know many of the board members were there, but many of the tours were by our bus driver. That were showing us the facility, the new technology, the new staff intaking areas, the the even the the um, the availability of data that we have at our fingertips now to help our families understand where our buses are and where our students are, and if a bus stopped at someone's home, and so it just it felt different. And I I made the comment that 18 months ago we weren't expecting transportation to be a major conversation, um, but tonight with the dedication was a clear reminder. Of the progress we've made, and we have we have we have challenges everywhere. But if you notice, as a district and as a community, rightfully so, we're always focused on the next challenge. We're always, and we we were quick to when we fix something, we're quick to move forward. But today, we sort of at five o'clock step back, and we were reminded of the progress we've made in transportation. I thank all of the the bus drivers as well as the transportation staff for that work. Number two, kindergarten registration. Um, you know, it's almost 23, 24. So kindergarten registration begins February 1st. We have information on our website. We have registration information. Um, all of our elementary schools are hosting kindergarten meet and greets on Thursday, February 9th from 6 to 7. So um, if you know someone whose student is approaching uh, five um, that's eligible for kindergarten, that information is there. Next on Wednesday, I know we were represented with, uh, by Board President Sure, but at Tri-North, we had um, the dedication of the gym in honor of Coach uh, Joe Body, and it was a really special evening, and, and we are pleased to see that move forward. Uh, I know that's been a long time in the making, um, working with the architects, but it, it couldn't have been a nicer evening. And um, it was we we celebrate that. And if you haven't had a chance to visit Tri North, just the facility in general, and and now that we have named the gym uh, after a beloved coach in our community, um, we want to give special recognition to that. Next, we have gyms registration. Uh, Stands for Girls in Engineering, Math, and Science. Uh, the event is open to all uh, students. Um, the MCCSC and the Foundation are hosting our sixth annual conference on Saturday, March 25th of this year. The uh, event is held at Bloomington North. Uh, it is an inclusive event for all fifth and sixth grade students who reside in the boundaries of uh, Monroe County uh, who are interested in exploring the world of STEM. So again, additional information on that is on our website. Next, I do want to point out the National I Love My Librarian Award. I was asked about this on a radio interview today uh, by Mike uh, Glasscott, and um, we want to recognize uh, Dr. Julie Marie Fry. I know that many of you know her. Um, she's primary years program school librarian and tech coordinator at Childs Elementary, and she recently received National I Love My Librarian Award. There were over 1,500 nominations, and she was selected. So there's a lot of examples, a lot of things on Child's website that really just uh, recognize the creative, innovative things she does to help students with the love of reading. And if I turn this back over to, to Kathy Fuentes for she could talk for an hour about this topic in and of itself. Um, but nonetheless, we do want to congratulate Dr. Fry for the positive impact she has in the lives of students every day. And lastly, just a reminder that with the inclement weather and based upon the closure of county government, we have announced that tomorrow is an, um, um, a, a real-time synchronous e-learning day. Um, we have information, we've sent information out to families. We have it on our website. 
And so what we tell families is we thank you for uh, your, your understanding and your cooperation on this as we work to keep our students safe. Um, and thank you to our teachers who are working hard to provide that instruction in real time. Um, if you have questions, uh, just email, talk to your, your teacher, your building levels are sending out schedules as we prepare really for our first um, uh, real-time synchronous learning. As you know, the state legislature has once again intervened in ways they probably didn't need to and dictated how we have to do e-learning as well as other things. We will do a legislative update at the February meeting. I had a few talking points, but special thank you. I know that Board Member Prani and uh, Board Member uh, Fuentes Roar continue to be involved in that, uh, make calls, advocate. I know that I'm going with Paul Farmer to the State House, uh, I believe, in early February to continue to advocate for MCCSC and most general K-12 public non-charter education and uh, the need for funding uh, as well as the need for um, um, ad additional protections that will continue to uh, recognize the success of K-12 public education. So again, uh, no school tomorrow in person. And uh, with that, I close my call. Thank you, Dr. Hazel. The next regular scheduled board meeting will be on Tuesday, February 28, 2023. This meeting is finished. We finished do have items to sign. <laughs>